Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order this work study session for Independent School District 624. Uh, before we get started and call the roll, I just want to tell everybody to please be patient. Uh, the technology piece, we're used to doing it a different way um, during the pandemic, and I want to just let everybody know we're, we're working through this to make sure we stay social distanced and make sure that everybody stays safe. So uh, with that, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Hold on one second. I don't know which number that is because I was supposed to get a I'm packet. 10. So 10? Thank you. So can you turn on mic 10, please? Ellison, here. Mullen? Here. Newmaster? Here. Thompson? Here. Arcan? Here. Malloyd? Here. Chapman? Here. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move into our first uh, Discussion item B1, which is the 2020-2021 uh, fall planning update. Dr. Kazmercheck, mic one, please. All right, thank you, Chair Mullen, members of the board. All right, I'm gonna start us off tonight. I, I just wanted to point out uh, a couple of things on our, on our website. Our return to school guide has been updated. We, uh, we have a fall 2020 FAQ document. There was quite a bit added to that uh, late last week and that will continue to be uh, added to throughout the, um, you know, thro throughout the foreseeable future. Um, again, the fall 2020 uh, guide and website is available. And then also if you notice at the bottom of, the, of this particular slide, um, the fall 2020 updates Click here is a, is a banner across the top so that it's much more easy for, for folks to find that. So now I just want to stop and pause. Do you, do board members, do you have the presentation up on your screen? So I, yeah, okay. I know you, you and you can see the, the one behind me, I think, to get an idea where we are, so. All right. Okay, and then this, I, I just wanted to sh share this, uh, White Bear Lake Area Educators, um, came up with this, uh, with this um, graphic um, reminding folks to socially distance, wear a mask, stay home and sick, wash, and to wash hands. And so we um, are supportive of this um, uh, effort, obviously, and we're gonna work to uh, help to distribute this and make this widely available. So um, hats off to the White Bear Lake Area educators for taking the initiative to pull that together. All right, with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gillespie to uh, move into K-12 grading, uh, a hot topic from uh, a few months ago, and we're here to give you an update on how this is gonna look coming up this school year. Dr. Gillespie, before you get started, can I just have a quick question? Mm -hmm. um, so as we work through this PowerPoint, um, as board members have questions, would you prefer that they wait till the end or can they can we just kind of move through it what would you prefer no we can move move through it and ask questions whenever okay i Thank have you. some of our colleagues here with us from elementary and secondary administrators to answer questions too so all right i appreciate it welcome Thank all you. Thank you. Thank you. So as promised, we have an update around grading as we move into the fall 2020-2021 um, school year. And so we uh, attended a conference called Grading for Equity with 19 leaders in July, leaders from district building, teacher and our union leadership to really learn more around grading and what we wanted to accomplish as we think about starting the school year and then moving beyond this school year. We have two working groups that um, signed up between leadership and again, teacher and union leadership to really decide what do we start with and then beginning the conversation and moving into doing um, research and looking at the system wide. It is something that will take us multiple years to really dive into and so we wanted to build upon the work that we started in the spring knowing that we learned a lot. We're proud of the work that we did but um, we're moving from that crisis plan to a more sustainable plan and we didn't want to add more work into our system, but we also know that we need to be able to um, move forward with a letter grade system based on feedback that we received not only from our community, but also from post-secondary partners and um, research that we continued. Again, equity was, was and continues to be the foundation of our work. 
our commitment and equity commitment continues to support this work. When we think of nurturing the whole student, we disrupt systemic inequities by recognizing, honoring, and embracing all cultures with humility and respect. We continue to use the equity decision-making protocol when we think about our grading. And so thinking about how do we provide opportunities for students who've been marginalized within the system in the past? How do we ensure that we have equitable access for all? How do we eliminate barriers based on race, race ethnicity, gender, disability, age, and other protected groups? And then again, how do we ensure the same rigorous standards for academic performance exist for all students? And so we received a lot of feedback during the spring, as, as you know, um, and then we continued to receive feedback throughout the summer around what are we going to do, do with grading as we move into this fall. And one thing that continued to emerge from both students and families was that we needed grading that included letter grades. And students felt really passionate about this, and it was across the board in terms of students, whether they were really successful and often received A's as letter grades, or they were students who felt um, like they wanted a chance to, to increase their GPAs and what that looked like. Additionally, families really asked us to look at how that would impact their students moving forward, knowing that, again, we felt really positive and proud of what we did in the spring, but knowing that we have now a school year that we're looking at and the long-term impact is different now. So as we look at what we're doing, we wanted to honor both the elementary and secondary aspect. And so it was really exciting to work with both those groups. And I wanted to have both groups share the work that they did, our decisions that we made thus far, and then our commitment to analyzing data, looking at um, learning opportunities for more educators, more staff, and then continuing the conversation this year well into the future as we navigate making sure that our grades and how we um, communicate how our students are, are achieving within our district is equitable. So now I'll introduce our colleague, Lori Mosier, principal at Onika, to talk about elementary grading. Good evening. Welcome. All right. So do I need to address myself again? Lori Moser, Principal of Anika. All right. So our report cards, when we looked at, you know, when we pulled the elementary grading committee together, is we wanted to keep that foundation of our standards being based on a three is meets grade level, uh, two is partially meets, and one um, does not meet. And then to continue to monitor and not land on you know, having children just stop at that one, but how do we actually get them to a two or a three? So that's how we have always done our grading at the elementary level. We wanted to preserve that moving forward. And just knowing what was in line with how Joe Feldman, you know, presented all that information to us equitably, you know, we believe that, hey, you know, some of these things we are truly already doing in an equitable grading practice when we look at our standards base and how we um, evaluate our students based on success criteria and the standards, you know, from the state. And then in line with our equitable grading or the equitable um, protocols is we really looked at what can we do also, looking at us, our um, strategic plan of the, having students be the agents of their learning, how can we bring that back into our grading practices as well? So we wanted students to be able to develop ownership of their learning through practice with support. They're involved in goal setting and progress monitoring of their learning and develop an understanding of their learning progress. So with this model, we think that we can achieve that this year, you know, working with smaller groups of, of students too. And ensuring that they have multiple opportunities to demonstrate mastery. So trying to get, you know, that's the goal of all of us as teachers is to get our students to mastery. So how can we ensure that they have multiple chances to get a three and meet grade level standards? And then to be really explicit with our rubrics and our success criteria so that students and parents know what the learning outcomes are and the expectations so that it is very clear and explicit that this is what I need to do to get to that meets level. And then having teachers as well understand that across, you know, the grade level. Because sometimes, you know, in the way I interpret something is going to be different from somebody else. So that's how do we ensure that everyone has that same interpretation. Uh, learning habits. So that's like, if you think about behavior, you know, and keeping that out of the actual score, you know, so if somebody's going to meet standards, it's not based on if they turn something in late or um, if they weren't paying attention in class. It's not those learning skill habits are going to be evaluated separately from that learning standard. And then homework, making sure that that's practice 
and not factored into the final score. And that was uh, really, you know, came out really clear, you know, with the uh, training that we got from Joe Feldman. Good evening, everyone. Ann Nelson, principal at North Campus. I'm going to be the clicker for both Matt Manier and I, uh, so we don't have to fuss with the, with the gloves as much. But um, like Dr. Gillespie said, in the spring of last year, we spent a lot of time really thinking about um, our equitable grading practices and not wanting to punish students for the way that they were managing the stress of the pandemic. Um, while we're looking at starting school and we know we need letter grades, we also know that that still exists. We're still managing stress. Um, and so the first thing that our committee did was we wanted to take a look at what do letter grades mean and what would a scale look like? Um, so as you can see, there's definitions for letter grades A through D, with A and B really reflecting students doing work independently or on their own with um, less support. And then students with a C or D needing some more support and then you'll see that there's not an F grade. Um, this is something that also came from Joe Feldman, um, which was during a time of pandemic to, to have a student earn an F when we don't really know what that F means. Is it because they didn't learn the material or is it because they're having a hard time managing the stress of COVID-19 um, that we would lean towards assigning an incomplete if a student showed some um, evidence of mastery and then no grade would be for no evidence of learning. Like if they, if they truly did not show any evidence, that would result in them leaving, uh, needing to retake the course. But an incomplete would mean they gave us something and something's happening so they're not able to get to the D, but we will work with them to get them to the D um, in some sort of credit recovery format. And then the percentages would be as follows. And this is really just to streamline our, our, our system 612. So um, I can speak to North Campus last year did, did a lot of work around grading over the past couple years, a lot of research, and a lot of that research was used as part of this committee's work as well, um, looking at best practices and equitable grading. And Joel Feldman's book uh, and his conference was, was a piece of that. But um, just to make sure that 612, that everyone's using the same definitions of grades and then the same grading percentages um, is super important. So what will grades include and not include? Um, and I, I think that this is born out of an opportunity that COVID presents. As we've talked to staff over the course of planning this summer, a, a common theme that we're hearing is consistency. It's important that we be consistent and a grading policy that is consistent is one that is equitable for students. And so where do we get our grading policies from? At times, as a young educator myself, nobody said, here's how you grade. You just started grading. And I think that, that that sometimes happens as a necessity of need. And then you grow and you continue to, to utilize your skills and learn from your colleagues. And so those things sometimes just kind of get woven into our grades. And so we want to be really explicit that grades will not include things like tardies or participation. Um, good or bad behavior, however that's being um, determined. Um, late work, cheating, grade adjustments based upon behavior and non-academic indicators. And we want to make sure that we are a consistent um, system from elementary all the way up to them getting a high school diploma. And, um, and, and we want to make sure that we outline those things here. You want to So what are the additional parameters included? Um, we wanna make sure that we're really based around essential learning outcomes. Being very upfront with students about what we're looking for um, and how we can achieve that together as educator and student. Uh, that common summit of assessments make our, our, our students better so that uh, an experience in one classroom doesn't feel completely different. We still want the art of teaching and that's critically important, but the student should walk out of classroom A and classroom B, understanding and, and realizing what the standards were and if they've met them or if they still need to continue to work towards those. Uh, that teacher grade books are common and identical, again, talking about consistency and how 
um, again, COVID presents an opportunity for us to allow educators and students to feel very consistent. But we also know that there are classes where there are gonna be weighted grades, uh, courses especially that speak to college level credit, um, and that the ALC and our tech program will continue with pass and no credit and variable credits for students. Maybe I'll just add one more thing that these parameters, um, teachers are already doing these things, right? So when we look at common summative assessments, this isn't new work, this is just continued work, right? Um, just to make sure that the system is aligned 612. So as we think of next steps for us, really we'll monitor systemically data that our buildings have been paying attention to, but we haven't necessarily looked at it um, K-12. And um, so seeing where trends are, where are we seeing um, gaps in our system, and then gather, continue to gather feedback as we look at where do we move next in terms of ensuring that our grades are accurate and really measuring what our students know and are able to do in relation to standards and skills, but also um, how our teachers are navigating and where, where do we have hiccups along the way in the system. We um, have some opportunities for ver vertical conversations. Our, our elementary educators have been doing standards-based grading for quite some time now, and so how can we learn what they've been doing and the practices that they've implemented and the experiences that our younger learners in our system are coming into secondary with and how we can build upon that. We need to talk more about learning habits. Um, all of us want to make sure that we're building those learning habits with our students, but how do we do so in an equitable way and really build those habits that our industry and post-secondary partners want to see in our students, but interrogate those and so that we're not unintentionally enforcing biases that we may or may not have based on how we experienced our system. Um, and by system, I mean our educational system. We need more opportunities to learn together around grading, both as leaders and educators. And then North Campus is gonna to continue to move forward. They've done a lot of work around grading. Um, and there's opportunities as building leadership teams wanna dive deeper into grading. Grading is one of the most um, emotional things that we do as educators, and we care deeply about how we assess our students, and so it requires a lot of time. And um, making sure that we really give our educators time to, to do the research so that we understand why we're making the, the changes that we are making that. So that is where we are right now. Any okay. questions regarding the grading? Uh, Mrs. Beloit, uh, Mike 12. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Um, I just have a couple questions. So the common summative assessments, um, what does that look like at elementary and what does that look like at secondary? I'm not sure I'm, if they're gonna be common summative assessments. What exactly does that mean? Common summative assessments at secondary are similar um, it, unit tests or their end of a you know a bigger chunk of all of language arts nine has a, a similar paper on what they're teaching something so they're grading a, a topic and everyone's grading the same standards and skills and looking at that um, elementary i would need lori to help me with is it similar it's, same. it's the same yeah so it they've spent our, our t educators have spent a long time really looking at the standards and how do we look at measuring those standards across our, our collaborative teams and, and how are we measuring those with an assessment that's common, looks the same with all of our students so that we can see where are we doing well in terms of our, the teaching and how our students are doing and where can we improve and help our students um, master those skills differently. So is that not something we were doing previously? Yep, it is. It really, the first three four bullets are reinforcing stuff we've been doing for a significant amount of time. So if I have two different science teachers or three different science teachers between North and South Campus all teaching the same class, they would be using the same assessments for all of their students? Same subject, same assessments, yep. So if okay. they have physical science uses the same assessments, biology uses the same assessments. But would the teaching be different? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so how will the, if participation and engagement is not gonna be part of the grade, how does, how does that look for secondary? It says that for elementary, those habits are gonna be assessed. Is that something that's assessed and put on 
um, the report card at elementary and what does that look like for, for secondary? So last year, North Campus implemented kind of the same thing that we're suggesting now, where late work wouldn't be penalized, um, and some of the behaviors, academic behaviors, would not count towards the grade or be assessed. Um, and what we saw is it really is a lot of natural consequences. Um, so students have to learn a different way to, to use their studying habits, and if they didn't, um, if they didn't do well on a summative assessment, they had an opportunity to continue learning and show their learning. Um, by completing a relearning plan. So by coming in and meeting with the teacher, completing um, the assignments that they had not completed to show that they could do it. Uh, and, and I think that there's this fear that the mass majority of students would just not do it if they didn't get points for it, but that's just not what we saw. Um, so we saw students struggle a little bit, honestly, at first, um, around just this idea of if I'm not gonna get points for it, I'm not gonna do it. Um, but soon they realized that if they didn't do it, they wouldn't do well on the summative assessment. And the summative assessment was 85% of their grade. So that was important to them. So they would continue to come in and work with staff around those things. I don't, does that answer your question? It so does. there isn't a spot on the report card for secondary um, where it would say something about their behavior. That would have to be communicated in a different way. So if it was attendance, it would be attendance and Skyward. If it's behavior and non-engagement, it would be conversations with parents around what that looks like in the classroom, but it wouldn't be grade impacting. Okay, so I guess, um, I guess my only um, issue with that is, so participation in world languages, I mean, that you would have to have some sort of participation in order to be able to do that, or in band or so Music there are some content areas where there's um, participation standards. It's actually in their standard to have participation, like FIED has that. Then there can be a rubric attached to that so that it's actually assessed by a rubric, just like a paper would be assessed by a rubric or a project. Um, but it wasn't just the teachers kind of saying, um, I think you're participating enough or not enough. We're really trying to remove that bias. So if there is particip participation required in some of the world languages, you're right, um, then there would be a rubric to assess it. So how do you make sure that, because there's some kids that do the homework really, really well, but they're not good test takers. Mm -hmm. So the summative assessments are gonna be those overall tests for the areas that you've been studying in the previous couple of weeks. Some of those kids, the homework and those types of things helps to offset if they get you know, a B plus on the, the test, but A's on all the homework, they still end up with, with mm -hmm. an A because they're doing the work. How do you, how are we gonna balance that? Right, well, and as part of looking at grades, grades are really looking at what a student can know and can do. And so we wanna look at the skills and the mastery of the standards, whereas um, when homework counts as a large part of their grade, it really is about collecting the points of the homework. Um, and it maybe is less about learning the material, but just getting the points to raise their grade. This system, it does require students to take a deep dive into the content and, and have to show what they know and can do. And so if they, if they didn't do well on it, they have to work with their teacher to increase their score, but actually learn the material in a different way. And so relearning might look like retaking the test. But it also might look like um, talking with their teacher and talking through the answers or writing an essay. It might look different based on what the student um, is capable of doing. And it allows them to show what they know and can do in a way that fits what, they, what they're comfortable with. How does that affect the AP classes and um, CIS? Because they have their own standards that come along with them. Right. So CIS is, is different in that way. So I, I'm not going to speak to that because I, we don't have any of those at North. So I know at South, um, in terms of like relearning and doing that, I don't want to give misinformation because I guess I'm not sure on that one. Um, but in terms of a, AP, we still want students to learn really at a deep level because when they take the AP exam, they're, they're required to show that they know and can do a lot, right? And so it really is the same it's the same pattern that I just described, where if they don't do well, they're gonna to have to come in, do some relearning, and the teacher and student determine what relearning looks like, and then, um, then they can increase their score. Well, but like for AP classes, depending on what they are, there's maybe three tests throughout the whole year. Mm -hmm. 
So their entire grade would be based off of those three tests as opposed to everything that builds into that previously, correct? Right, well, and it would be summative assessments. And so for, I know for some AP, that's essay writing projects and tests would all fall under the, under the summative assessment umbrella. Um, but let those daily points um, that would be homework, that at least at North last year, that was only 15% of their grade. You're right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chapman. Mike, uh, eight, please. Sorry. <laughs> Along the lines of what will uh, not be graded or what the grades won't include, I see cheating academic integrity. How is that going to be handled uh, if, if a student is caught cheating? What's going to be the protocol or the process for that? Mm -hmm. So what, again, academic or cheating is really an academic behavior. And so it wouldn't, um, I would say in the past, it would be, it could be, you can redo it, but you only get 50%. And then it goes back to if when you look at a student's grade, you don't know is that how they mastered the content or is it because of something they did behavior wise in the class? And so we do handle it as we would a behavior. Um, so that could result in a discipline referral, parent conference, and then really the opportunity for students to show what they know and can do and, and get those, you know, and, and resubmit the assignment. You know, when we think about cheating, it, it, it's super important to get to the heart of why a student cheated. And what we found in our old grading system, when it was more about point collecting, students did try to cheat um, because they needed all the points they could get in order to increase their grade. But when it's flipped and really it's about what a student can know and can do, you can't cheat on that. You know, so um, we didn't see a ton of cheating last year. We did see a little bit of it, but again, we handled it just like we would a behavior. So if you have a student that habitually, I mean, it sounds like it's not a big issue, but if you were to have a student that were, was caught repeatedly cheating, what would happen at that point? I mean. You would uh, look at suspension, expelling, whatever the. We would handle it just be. like a behavior, right? Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. But yeah, I we haven't had like many habitual cheaters. I would say because when you get to the heart of why the student was cheating, and address that, you know, with the student, um, yeah, we just don't see a lot of repeat offenders in that area. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Newmaster, uh, Mike Seven, please. Hmm. Okay, I guess I'm thinking of, of my years at North Campus and one thing that Ann said was that you don't have CIS at North anymore? Not a single class? Huh, okay. <laughs> I can speak to that. Jen Babish, um, Teaching and Learning. So um, Dr. Newmaster, um, with CIS we have our world language courses and um, AP as well and just to kind of speak to that grading piece we follow and work with the the college board directly and um, we've reached out to the University of Minnesota as well knowing that they are um, working each department really will determine kind of what those outcomes are for um, for learning and and so also I was on the phone today with um, Century College as well so um, you know with our CIS and AP we know that that is such an important piece of what we offer to students and so we want to do whatever we can during this time to ensure that they would be able to receive that credit that they deserve for um, completing those courses I'm not sure that that answers what I asked though because in the past we had like AP geography for ninth grade yep. and we had a American history class and I, know, I have a neighbor that carefully took one every year as she worked on it rather than have to cram it all into South Campus. So are you saying now no ninth and tenth graders can take a CIS course? So I know at, um, for our CIS course offerings, I guess I can take this off there. Um, I know we offer the world language and we do offer the German and the Spanish and the French. And so I think it, um, you know, from my experience and maybe a building principal can answer more specifically that um, it depends on the enrollment. If we have enough students to take that course, if it's at North or South, Well, I'm not talking about AP, I'm talking about the ones where you actually get a, um, 
credit. I realize some of those are AP, but what are the ones that you would determine is concurrent, simply German five and Spanish five, if we still have people that hit that point? Yes, or? yes, that is correct. Yeah. And then some of our pathway classes mm -hmm. are concurrent enrollment as well, but they wouldn't be, CIS are the ones that we partner with the UAM right. for. So there are none at North? Not, not specifically CIS, no. Okay. We have and AP, it's only if you take the test and pass it. it Again, yeah. that you get college credit, but you get a weighted grade for your high school grade because it was so robust. Yep. And okay, the and then my other question, thinking about all the emphasis on summative rather than behavioral things, what does that do to some of the massive projects that I used to help kids do that were collaborative, which was a big effort, and presentational? They can still be a summative when you're grading the different parts of them, correct? And then where it would be common is in the rubric. So they would use a common rubric so that it, whether it be a, a speech or a project or a presentation, they're still being assessed in a similar way even if the project itself looks different. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I'm thinking of different skills for a social emotional and the appeal of things. Sometimes in uh, a college music uh, class it's a performance or something like that that's your, your final summative. Mm -hmm. performance so it's not just a pen and paper test no. which no. means they better be well written mm -hmm. so okay yep. so your test could be an essay just like they are in college yep okay I think a lot of people when they hear the word test think something that's short answer mm -hmm. and not a full thought hardly Yep. Yeah, could teachers it, could spend a lot of like time in their teams developing the summative assessments, and so they, they work really collaboratively together to make sure that they aren't all just paper and pen tests. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. I was hating to think everything was kind of like Europe, where it's the final end of the year pen and paper thing, mm -hmm. and everything rests on that, which would be terrifying to the test-anxious children. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Newmaster. Dr. Arcan, Mike Six. Um, first, I'd just like to say thank you um, what you're doing with grading. I know that we started talking about this in 2008 with Ken O'Connor, how this doesn't represent the students' grades, so I'm great to see, uh, to see that you're going in that direction. Uh, the first question I have is one of the things I don't see is if you uh, talk to Ken O'Connor and other experts about eliminating zeros and how a zero in the grade book can uh, vastly affect that grade and not correctly calculate so I'm wondering if you're going to address that yeah we've we've talked we have done quite a bit of research on that and um, kind of the the floor of 50 in equal interval grading is kind of what you're referencing so when we worked with Joe Feldman um, and went through his conference we learned a lot about that um, and we did talk about it, and I can speak to the high school group at least, we did talk about it and really wanting to make sure that if we're going to have a solid grading system that everyone understands and feels really good about and is equitable, we need to make sure that we do so in a way that people can follow it, right? And if you do too much too fast, while it is um, the most equitable, uh, it might not get us to the results that we want. And so we really need to bring people along with us to continue to do the research and the work about what's going to be um, you know, best for our 612 moving forward, and, and that's definitely a topic that people want to explore. And I, I think Dr. Glossy can, can talk about it a little bit, but you know, this work isn't stopping now, so I know that we'll continue to look at that because that is um, the most equitable, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the other thing that we've heard talk about here, the concerns about behavior in the classroom, uh, if we talk to people in industry, that's one of the things they tell us they're concerned also. So you have to get creative. How do we grade what you know and can do, and how do we grade your, your actual behavior. So one of the things I know places are developing is a, a work readiness standards, mm -hmm. and so what you end up having is, is your grade on the content, and then you get a grade on your work readiness, and then that can be laid out. So that way an employer, when somebody comes in and you have two people side by side that got Bs, the determining factor can be, you know, what was your work? Um, readiness as you were preparing. That's one of the ways they're addressing that, but I, I still say it's very important that you remove those. Um, and I applaud you once again because it does change the focus from grade, grades, A, B, C, D, to focusing on learning. And, that, and so that's the way we need to go, so keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other questions about around grading? Okay, thank you. Dr. Kazbercheck, number 13, please. Thank you. Oh, it's not on yet. Mike 13. Put the switch on. There we go. All right, thank you uh, on the update on grading. Um, a lot of great work going on with grading. Even be, before this, uh, this spring, there was a lot going on, and I think this has allowed us to accelerate that work, so very much appreciated the, the presentation. Um, so at this point, I, I um, think if board members, if you have questions about fall reopening, we, we entertain those. And, um, but I also want to start off uh, this portion by saying that um, I've had a lot of conversations in the last uh, last couple of weeks about the plan to open, and um, I think at this point I'm going to I'm going to be recommending that we delay the start of the school year to September 14th to allow our system to um, be more ready for the school year. I've talked to um, you know you know you name it principals, transportation folks, buildings and grounds, educators. Um, human resources and having that extra time to prepare for the school year will allow us to to start the year in a better spot. Um, I would uh, remain with a um, plan to move ahead with a K-12 hybrid model um, and we'll continue to monitor our county data. Um, again, we're hopeful that we'll start to see some additional data that would uh, allow us to see more granu granularly what our um, zip code data looks like, for example. I know the, um, that, that has, we haven't had any headway yet with Ramsey County on that, but, um, but we're trying. So, so anyway, that, that, that's where we're at, and we're certainly willing to, there's a whole crew here, and we'll, we'll be able to answer your questions. I know Dan Rozier is down here. Uh, Rebecca Edberg is here, sitting in place of Matt Mons, who was unable to be here tonight. So we're happy to take your questions. Questions regarding the opening of school, Mr. Chapman, Mike, eight. You gotta, you gotta bear with me. What will this uh, pushing this back a week? Uh, what would this do as far as the school calendar? So what we'll do is on the 14th, at, uh, on the board meeting on the 14th, we'll come to you with an updated calendar, and we'll. We'll pull days from within the from throughout the school year to make up that difference. Maybe maybe not a one for one, but um, so two or three days would likely pull from where we'd have school during the school year. Or we wouldn't have otherwise to make up for that time for student contact. You know, we have to make sure that we're meeting our statutory requirements with, with student contact time. So we'll need to work through that. But so we'll come. Plan? I'm sorry, the, yep. so the plan would be that the school year wouldn't be extended on the, the back side? No, it wouldn't be extended on the back side. And we do have some time um, to transition from one learning model to another um, throughout the year, but I, you know, we wouldn't want to use up all that time or a big, significant amount of that time just to begin the school year. So we'd want to hold on to, to that um, in case we do need to shift throughout the year. And, Obviously, we don't know if that will happen, but you know it's likely. Okay, okay. thank you, Ms. Ellison. Mike, ten. Thank you, Chair Mullen. I have a couple of questions. Um, I was looking again at the MDE recommendations um, and was surprised to find so little in those recommendations about teachers. Um, there's a section at the end called Educator Support and Professional Learning. And there's a question that struck me is what plans do we have to ensure staffing capacity? What policies or regulations need to be updated to support staff? And how do we protect staff who are most at risk from COVID-19? So I guess my question is how, or one of my questions is how are we accommodating staff who have the health risks? I was doing some digging today and found that there are a couple of school districts like Stillwater and Matamidi who have designated online teachers. And so I'd like to know if this is an option for our teachers so that we're not asking them 
to choose between their health and their job. Um, because I, I don't know how many, if teachers are asking for a leave of absence, how many can we absorb before we're, we are not meeting our staffing capacity? I don't know if you, Allison and Rebecca, if you want to, I don't know if Rebecca, you've been in, I think you've probably been involved in some of the conversations, but I know um, certainly Allison and Matt have, have um, some detail on that. So we have been um, working with HR, with the principals to figure out um, what alternative ways we can support um, and what remote teaching assignments would look like. And so we have an advisory council that we're partnering with union leadership and meeting on Fridays. And our goal is to have a concrete plan for specific staff members who've asked for it and what we can accommodate by this Friday for the requests we've had thus far, K-12. So what that looks like and what we can accommodate and still be able to offer hybrid and how we provide those supports. So, yeah. So, so by Friday, those teachers that have made that request will have an answer one way or the other. We would, yeah, I, in terms of the communication mm -hmm. plan, I don't, I don't know how that would work through HR, but we would have a concrete plan that we would communicate and partner with our advisory council because we talked about it at our first meeting um, and partnering in ideas that we have. So that would be our plan is to have something concrete and be able to talk about it more from conceptual to actuality in terms of what does this look like. We do have a few of our elementary buildings that were really innovative and in thinking of ways to flex within their current staffing, but not of all of our elementaries have that same flexibility, so we're trying to be really creative, so yeah. And, and what's the status on hiring for subs? Um, I can speak to that a little bit. Can you please turn on mic 15? Thank you. So we did have the active posting for full-time reserve teachers out, and that is still currently open. We were very successful in recruiting in that position, so we have an active candidate pool for building subs um, that we're prepared to offer to help fulfill the need for our employees out on leave. Okay. Um, I, I've had some, I've heard some concerns from various people who support various school models about how academics would be impacted. And, and so in the MDE document, there's a section called learning loss. Um, and it says that when teachers increase expectations without providing more supports, students' outcomes have been shown to decline. And I guess my concern is that the increased expectations of distancing and masks and cleaning and transitions will affect academic achievement. And our teachers are excellent, and I'm not disputing that at all, but they're teaching students an entirely new way to be at school will most certainly impact the academic content that teachers are able to, to deliver. And so um, what, are gonna, what are the supports gonna be in place in the buildings to ensure that teachers' primary focus is going to be on their academic content and social emotional learning. Say more about supports. I'm hearing about safety or? Yeah, about safety. So if, if teachers are going to be teaching their course, but then also having to teach students how to do a new way of school. And we, we know that that will take a little while. So if teachers are gonna be monitoring keeping kids apart and cleaning things and you know not having necessarily the if you're in elementary the pullouts for IEP students um, how are we going to assure that all those safety precautions which are essential are not going to hinder mm -hmm. teachers ability to do the work that they are trained to do um, I'm just I'm concerned about the the workload with all these other requirements now for teachers. I can have some of my principal friends talk about some of the safety, but I, I don't know that I'm understanding the question. Either. Yeah, I guess, I, I may, and I'm not saying it very eloquently, I apologize, but um, if, if, if a teacher's in a class with kids and teaching kids in their class and then also kids um, that are at home distance learning, but then they're also expected to teach them and constantly saying, okay, stay back, okay, 
you got to stay there and make sure you have your mask on, put your mask on. Um, student with IEP, maybe they, there's not, you know, somebody to come do a pullout. That just feels like a lot of extra other duties as assigned. Um, and so I, I, know that, I know that our teachers can deliver the content, but it just feels to me like it's increased expectations could lead, lead to learning loss. And I, I don't want this to be taken as, of course, I, I know that teachers can do this work, but it feels like a heavy load. Ms. Ellison, may I help for one second? Sure. Are you indicating that, are, do we have the protocols in place to make sure that there's an increase in staff, to make sure that they can handle the extra load that's gonna be put upon them during this time of, of need? Yeah, because I mean, I looked at the, the recently updated um, back to school, return to school document, and I, I printed out the, the two images, and I annotated them actually with the, like a parent and educator lens, and I was just thinking about, you know, if, if um, a classroom is set up in this certain way, and it's six feet apart, but teachers can't walk down the aisle, because then that would put them three feet apart. You know, so how does that affect their ability to teach? And then if they've got to clean between classes, how much time does that take? Um, what, you know, what is the, who does this additional sanitation throughout the day? So, I've, I mean, I've got a lot of notes here, but yes, that, that is what I'm asking. You got it? Yeah. So I'm, I can answer part of it, and then I'll have Jen Babish talk a little bit more about the, what it looks like to have students in front of you and at home. I'll, I'll let her address that piece. But... I think when we start any school year, there's always the estab establishing norms and expectations and behaviors. And this, while we've never had to teach students to wear masks and to socially distance, we have had to teach students how to have appropriate behavior in class. So that's not, that's not new, just what we're teaching will be slightly new, right? And I totally hear what you're saying. Desks will have to be arranged in a certain way. And it's less than ideal, but it's how we can get students back in the building in a safe way. Um, and it's not, of course, how we would want it to be. And it is going to look different. Um, I have two young children, and so I know that I, I work with them about mask wearing and socially distance, and they're very in tune to it. Um, I've also attended some of our student group meetings recently, and they too want to be safe. They want to wear masks. They want to make sure that they're doing what they need to do because they don't want to get sick. Um, and so I think, you know, I think there's a lot of fear that all students are just going to not wear masks and huddle up and, and not follow any rules and expectations, but I really don't believe that to be true. And for the students who do push it, which they may, um, there is protocols in place to address that. Because mm -hmm. the bottom line is you have to socially distance, you have to wear a mask, you have to be safe, and you have to use you know, sanitizer. So I think um, we do have those in place. And then I was gonna uh, just mention something about, you know, like the distance, you know, like having teachers, you know, be in close proximity to students. And I believe like if, if it's not for a prolonged time of 15 minutes, you know, as long as they're wearing masks and you, I can come and I can, yep, you're doing great. Okay, you're doing, you know, and you can still get to a student, you know, within, you know, like that two or three feet. But as long as you're not staying there for that, you know, 15 minutes or more, then the exposure is, is minimal. And I know that at um, our extended day at Onika, the kids have been fantastic about hand washing, wearing their masks, following the directions of staff. Um, they have done an amazing job. And yes, it's a smaller number of kids, but I have seen it work at elementary. And you know, I just I have faith in our teachers and, and our students that they're gonna be able to pull it off and do it. And and yeah, it's gonna take some time, you know, and that's you know, with any new thing, it's going to take some time, but I'm confident that they can do it. And one more piece I would say, you know, for secondary, because we are studying, starting out in the hybrid model, um, and we know that we have families that are choosing distance learning, it will be less than 50% of students in the classroom. So I think, um, I know I've talked to a lot of teachers who had some of the same concerns, and when we talk through what their classroom might actually look like, um, I think that some people were thinking about it in terms of, you know, I'm gonna have 30 to 34 students in front of me, but that's not true. It will be about 15, so much more manageable numbers. Um, and in terms of that we're managing just three classes a day for the first four weeks will definitely help in terms of workload. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jen Babish. I can talk a little bit about just our flexible learning model and the instructional framework that we're using. And um, I think 
One of the big things is we're, we're going to be using the gradual release of responsibility for instruction. And so um, that work is from um, Douglas Fisher and Nancy Fry, and it really is best practice instruction. And so the idea is um, we start with the I do, the teacher, with a focused instruction lesson, and then we go into we do, and so the teacher can work with the students, and then we go to you do it together, which promotes collaborative work, and then it moves to independent work. And so as we think about synchronous and asynchronous learning with that model, we know that we can provide that um, direct instruction with focused um, instructional um, recordings or short videos to help kids that they can do asynchronously. That could be a live um, lesson in the classroom as well. And um, when we look at the we do and you do together, that collaborative work is going to be so important. And so that's where we really um, can use our technology with our Google Meet to um, have kids that are possibly in distance learning and face-to-face, uh, -face, even be in groups together so that they're collaborating. And then um, the teacher can, can still be in the room and be checking in, maybe working in a small group with students that are, are stuck, that need a little bit more reteaching before that would be pushed out to then an independent work. And so that's, that's um, the, the framework that we're going to use to help support teachers. And really, it is best practice. And um, most of them are using that uh, framework already. And you know, just conversations I've had with, with teachers, it is kind of just one-on-one -on -one and um, them talking with their departments um, or grade levels to figure out, OK, so what does this mean for us? How can we work together and collaborate to share that load of instruction as well? So that may be one, you know, I'm a team member that's going to to do the instructional video for this lesson um, this week and so that kind of takes the the burden off of the rest of the grade level teachers to really work together um, to ensure that we have that um, rigorous curriculum okay. thank you um, I just I have one more question um, I have a couple others, but I'm, I want to make sure there's time for my colleagues and I, I might check in with Dr. Kazmachek and Dr. Gillespie about some of my my notes that I made on this document. Um, but I wanted to ask a question about the multiple points of entry. Um, if we're talking about students coming into the buildings from multiple points, I, I hate to even say this, but if we're, if we're living in a time where we require lockdown drills and we know what has happened in schools, how can we assure our families that our buildings are safe? If we, if we have kids coming in and out of multiple places. Now, I only have kids in elementary and middle school, so I have not been in the high schools as much, and there might be policies. But in looking at some of these documents, how can we be assured that our buildings are going to be safe? So I can speak to North. We'll still be using our same entry points. You know, in the morning, there was always two ways for students to come in through the building on Division and Bald Eagle. Um, and then there's staff who are assigned supervisors that will be there, um, especially now as we make sure we need to monitor social distancing. So that won't change a whole lot in that, in that way. Um, when it comes to dismissal, we'll have a staker dismissal time. And so again, um, they'll be exiting out the same doors that they would have normally if school was just back in session. And at elementary, we will have staff stationed at the doors, both for arrival and dismissal, at least two or three. Um, being able to direct kids and watching kids come in, you know, and same with the buses in the back. So we'll have staff monitoring everything. So that might just be helpful to put a little bit more detail on the website because as a parent, that's, and maybe I'm crazy, but that was the first place my, my brain went, is multiple points of entry, are my kids going to be safe? So thank you. Is that Dr. Newmaster, Mike, seven, please. Okay, I'm going to add to a couple that uh, Ms. Ellison started off on, and one refers back to an earlier time when we met and were talking about how teachers would be free, as they always are, to take a class outside. And I was thinking also about the doors. So if your class is very hot, it's an inside room at North Campus, 
and you want to take your language class outside or your art class or whatever. I don't know that you're saying they can only go out the one door that they came in on because that's our hardened door or they could go out the door that's closest the teacher can use their card to go back in again because one of the things we need to do is spread kids out allow them a chance and I've talked to a lot of people in the last two weeks and had many emails and phone calls and some of them have said well if I go out with my kids and we're so dependent now on our Chromebooks there's no Wi-Fi out there you know so they're thinking about that as they're trying to think of spaces they could work with a class and take them out so part of it is the thing Jessica brought up are they allowed to go out anything but the hardened main door which is a two block walk if you're at the high school south or north or can you just go out the closest door and come in and work outside and manage to sit either in the stadium or in the grass on the goose poop so <laughs> that that if a, if a teacher is with and they have a key card you mm -hmm. know then the, they would be coming in through a secure door with their teacher that's really appropriate still um, I think when we look at this fall, uh, even outdoor space is really going to be regulated and, and managed because we have classes that um, require to be outside right now for safety reasons. Um, you know, our FIAD classes will be mostly outside when they can. Some of our music classes, in order to follow some of the safety protocols as of right now, will also be outside. So we're even scheduling kind of classroom type areas. Um, so it will look different um, than then in the past when teachers maybe would just be able to go outside to get some fresh air, it will look a little different just to make sure that we're, everyone has a spot and, and that it's safe and following the safety protocols. Okay, well, that's one question. Another question I had went back to our HR question. And again, I'm thinking back of something that Matt Mon said probably two meetings back when I asked him about how they were making accommodations for people that had issues if they would be allowed to be a distance teacher since a significant portion of our population maybe 20 percent has chosen distance and I know a couple of those families they plan on distance um, and so they and what I heard then was yeah we're going to be working on that and what I've heard recently is people are being asked to take a leave because there's no distant positions and I know some other districts have people assigned to distance. So I'm just wondering how we handle that. And maybe that's something you can't answer today, but that's a pretty important question. If we have, what's 20% of 8,000? I'm no mathematician, but it's a lot. <laughs> so um, I think that's important. And then the other part is if we have, and I have a neighbor that's talking about distance, um, is that student kind of a person on the side for a classroom teacher? They thought they were going to have a distance teacher, and that was their distance classroom with distance students across the... So I think that's kind of a misunderstanding that I had that apparently parents have. They don't realize that their student is maybe a couple of distance students attached to this classroom and a couple to that. And if you're, uh, let's say, a science teacher, that has a, a, a problem and, and it would be really risky to be in the classroom face to face while the virus is still raging. Um, there's no reason why, the good thing about a distance teacher is they're in one place. They can gather kids from all their houses, doesn't matter. There's no transportation. So I'm just wondering how we've looked at that option. So that was one of my questions. Have we looked at distance are they part of a school community of their own, just like some of the other online schools? Because they're not looking at it, most of them that I've talked to, as a temporary. They're looking at it as a choice, because this is not going to be over soon, they believe. Or maybe they have someone in their household that's on chemo or something. Um, and my other... Dr. Newmaster, let's yeah. get an answer to that question before we move on to the next okay. one. Is that all right? So I'm just kind of referring to questions that have been asked already that I still don't feel that I've got any kind of a, an answer to. Dr. I can, I, can, check, or? I could speak to the distance learning piece if you wanted. Um, I'm sure. Thank you. 
Okay, so as of right now, no, distance learning students would not be assigned to a distance learning school or academy or, t or teachers. Um, that's not a program that we had going into this, and so it's not something that we clearly have established yet. Uh, what I would say is the, the final data is starting to come in in terms of exactly who is going to be staying home for, for distance learning. And so now it is kind of a puzzle, at, at least at the secondary level. We, it's really important for students to have content level teachers um, that they're working with. And so to see who exactly is going to be staying home and then what teachers do we have that are also looking for those accommodations and trying to match them. Um, I, again, I can speak to North. We, we don't have a, a lot of that happening yet. Um, and in terms of our student population, um, we're just nailing down exactly who and what those schedules look like and how they could potentially be matched. I um, mean, it is a giant puzzle, I have to say. Um, but I, I don't know that it's, it's remaining at that 20% at every site. So um, that's another variable that needs to be taken into account. But as this, um, you know, families have been asked to do their online annual update, um, for high school, it's to release the schedule tomorrow, the 25th at 6 o'clock. So we should have a much more clear picture of exactly who is planning on staying home. And then if we're able to make those accommodations, those are the conversations that we can have now um, that we weren't able to have before because we were just working with rough numbers without here's how many kids in physical science would need a physical science teacher. And then is there a physical science teacher looking for an accommodation, if that makes sense. I don't know if you want to talk to yeah, Okay, and then at our elementary level, we are assuming that our distance learning students are a part of that classroom. So if they have Mrs. Johnson uh, right now, that's where we have them placed and they will be a part of Mrs. Johnson's class. And they will have access to everything that that teacher is doing within that classroom. So if there is a mini lesson that they want to have a Google Meet and invite that student, you know, with the mini lesson that they're doing with three other kids, that student that is distance learning at all times is going to have access to that. They're gonna have access to pre-recorded lessons. So it's, it's like they are a student in that classroom and they will have opportunities, you know, to log in live, you know, for a Google Meet with their classroom at any time during the week. So it's like they are still a student, but they're just at home, but they will have opportunities to feel like a part of that class. So that's what we are working on right now at elementary and how that works either you know like with a synchronous you know live google meet happening with a mini lesson or asynchronously when the teacher has recorded like either pre-recorded during their prep times you know a mini lesson that they're going to deliver or they've recorded a mini lesson in real time with their students that then those distance learning students can access after and then having points of contact throughout the week with the students that are learning at home as well so they are considered any distance learning student is going to be considered a part of their community if they were an in person or not. So then are they assigned to an A or a B? So they really have a group that mm -hmm. only has learning with their group two days a week. Yes. So they are assigned, you know, so depending on where their alphabet falls. Yes. So then that's how we've marked them, you know, within our uh, class list right now. And that's the same thing we're looking at in high school? Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, so they, they really are making smaller cohorts because they are on an A-B schedule. Um, the students on, on Monday and Wednesday will potentially never interact with the Tuesday and Thursday students. And that would be whether they're hybrid or distance learning. Mm -hmm. Okay. 14. Dr. Uh -huh. Newmaster, really the supports we're looking at are trying to accomplish all those different things that you're talking about. And so how do we look at making sure that students feel part of a community. Is it that we can have a teacher who has a third grade classroom and the numbers work out and that's how that works out in that school community? Is it that we can have a language arts um, 11 teacher who has a classroom? It, 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 it's not as easy to say we have this structure because of all the numbers that, that come together. So really we have many creative teacher leader teams working with administrators thinking of all these different options, but I've been looking at those academy, online academy schools because I think it could be something maybe that we as a system want to talk about, but all of them have that. They also have what we're trying to do. So it's, it's not like it solves our current hybrid and how we're trying to do all this. It, it'll take a little bit of the numbers away, but they still are figuring out, you know, what about kids who have to quarantine for two weeks and all of these other intricacies. So it's not, it's not like it, it kind of pushes things into this solid school and then makes it in a easier, way to solve it. It actually adds a, a third 
or whatever number layer onto this complex problem that we're navigating right now. So Definite, the goal definitely would be complex. Um, you know, those were some of the things that my brain was spinning about and thinking about. Um, the distance portion. Um, and, the, and the other part of it that came up to me, came to me with many emails and a couple of discussions was your elementary specialists. And I know they've proposed some things to you. And I have a special love of music because both of my adult children, White Bear grads, are professional musicians, performers, and teachers. And all of them are doing special adjustments to teach what they teach fully that you can't easily do. And our elementary specialists, if we're looking at social emotional, they probably know the kids better than anybody because if they've been at that school as the music teacher, the FIA teacher, uh, the language teacher, they've seen those kids for three, four, maybe this is their fifth year. So that's why they made the suggestion and they certainly didn't want to not see kids, but they all have many, many contacts. So if they're doing their thing, and hopefully they start, because their curriculum is important to the kids and that connection is important, I think they counted, they had like 500 contacts. So their proposal, obviously, you know what it was, that they hope that they can provide twice a week or whatever it is to the kids they know, distance. So that was a question, was there a good response to that? rather than just having them pull outs and stuff ins with many more connections than anybody in the district has. And that's something that we are still, you know, really focused on trying to solve and work through with our specialists. And I know that I am, you know, Mr. Morris and I from um, Hugo are gonna meet with our specialists tomorrow to kind of work through some things. So, and that's just something that we are really still focus on as an elementary group and how do we how do we best use our specialists this year keeping them safe you know and keeping our students safe as well so that is a question that we I don't have an answer for you just yet but know that we are working on that a lot well that that's a that's a concern and it's a big one yep. and the kids that do well and love those classes mm -hmm. oh, may not do so well in other things mm -hmm. and it's everybody of every ability level but if they can't march and bang and sing uh, and do whatever, you've lost it. Where I know the FIA teachers feel they have space and outdoor areas. You don't have that with the language and the music and the instruments and things like that. Mm -hmm. No, I 100% agree with you, you know, and that's, you know, I have a student at home too who is 100% into band, does everything musical that you could possibly imagine at school. So yeah, it's, it's near and dear to my heart too, so. We are and I've been a Korean working. drum teacher in my basement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. since March mm -hmm. so it you need space and distance it works well you can do everything distance so that's another unanswered question I guess but I hope it's answered soon and the kids can continue having good relationships and that it's not skipped for a month and it's another lost thing I'll let somebody else have a turn mr. Chapman Mike eight thank you dr. Newmaster I've got a couple of questions. Uh, first off, has, the first one has to do with the mask uh, situation. I was under the impression that we were gonna have a mask policy come before the policy committee, and maybe I've missed a communication there at some point, and I realized that I believe MDE is not requiring, or, or MDH, one of them, is not requiring masks. How are we gonna handle the mask uh, enforcement? Um, what Un existing policy is going to come into play, or uh, I guess I'm a little confused as to where we're at with this whole uh, mask situation and uh, what we're gonna hinge the enforcement on. Ms. Orn, uh, mic 16, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chapman. Uh, we were working with Mick Waltzberger, our district lawyer, on uh, the mask or face covering policy. And at this time, we're gonna look at a procedure. So we have received it, um, and we are going through it with our principals right now to make sure that in its implementation, it works. And then uh, we will be bringing that back to this group at our next meeting. 
Okay. At, at the policy committee meeting or which meeting? Are, are I think we're going to start with a protocol and then we'll bring it to the policy meeting. Which won't be till mid-September or so, I believe. Right. So we'll have it in, in practice for when we start school as a protocol. Oh, go ahead. Dr. 13, please. Thank you. So the, the policy that is developed will be followed and because it's under the governor's executive order, the board actually doesn't need to take action on the policy. We will enforce what the governor says we need to enforce. If we take the next step of having the board review the policy, um, we would do that. And M uh, MSBA released the policy early, so we thought we had one ready to go, but then they, they needed to make some modifications to it, so it wasn't ready to come to the policy committee. And we had Mick Waldsberger, we took the extra step to have him review it to make sure that we weren't uh, you know, excluding a student from an education when we shouldn't be because of a mask issue. And so, um, again, it's being worked on, it'll be brought back. Whether or not it goes through the policy committee, <coughs> yet, yet may very well, but it will be enforceable from day one even if the board doesn't take action because it supports the executive order. Okay, okay thank you. Second question I've got has to do with uh, getting back to the question of uh, teachers uh, requesting leave. Uh, how many have requests have we received uh, from staff due to uh, medical reasons, citing medical reasons, either themselves or people in their household? Um, I'm just uh, wondering at this point how many have come in. Yes, I do. Um, the total leaves that we are currently tracking and working through with staff are under 40 requests. And that's a blend of those requesting a general leave and those who have a medical exemption or a medical base leave. Okay. So there's a wide variety of the requests that we've received. We're working through them individually. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Ms. Beloyd, Mike 12, please. So I just wanted to follow up on, on Kim's question. Um, so the, I, I think what everyone's trying to get down to is um, if someone can't wear a mask because of a physical reason, everybody understands that that's, there's going to be a policy for that. I think the question really is for those that just refuse, because we know we have some groups and some parents that, that won't wear them. What happens if they send their child, child isn't wearing it, gets on the bus, isn't wearing it, comes into school, isn't wearing it. I think that's kind of getting down to the nitty gritty of what then happens. Dr. Kazmierczak, Mike have, 13, please. Okay. 16. Can you, or, excuse me, 16, okay. please. Um, so with that, what we're working with is that to that level of detail. So when we were looking at the other policy, it wasn't talking about an interactive process that really talked about students that weren't wearing masks and the reason behind those. Um, and so what we have in this new protocol is something that gets to those exact questions and then how the administrative team would work with that student and family on the reasons why they're not wearing the mask. And then we have multiple options that we're building into our uh, pro uh, interactive process instead of maybe not just wearing the mask, but maybe wearing a shield and, and some different things that we have available. So this new protocol that we'll bring towards to you is gonna have that whole process to, to, to the point of refusal. Okay, that kind of answers. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, my other question, I kind of did the same thing that um, Ms. Allison did. I went through the MDH and MD and kind of had a couple questions on um, some, uh, some, some details. Um, do we already have our designated COVID-9 program, program coordinators for each building already? Yes. And has that been communicated to I'm assuming probably hasn't been communicated to the staff yet because the staff is just getting back, but am I correct on that? Mike three, please. Uh, so we have a district uh, COVID response team and we have building COVID response teams. At the building level, uh, typically it will be the principal or designee who will be the incident commander for the building response team. And then within, uh, within their team, they'll have certain responsibilities. The second, uh, the second position would be the uh, contact tracing person responsible for that. 
and, and then the communication specialists, all those different areas will be covered within their teams. And so the buildings are creating their own team and we'll have a district team that will um, mirror that. But do we know for sure that all of those teams have already been designated? Uh, I don't know. The buildings are creating their own teams. Principals can address that. Agress, then you're right when you say that it hasn't been fully communicated as staff aren't fully back yet. So right. just making sure we're not overwhelming people, but it's in the works and the coordinators are for sure identified and we're working with custodial staff and the nursing staff in the buildings. Um, so that will be coming, but yes, it's in the works. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is our specific plan to respond when someone tests positive? Because I know there's privacy issues. Um, and I just want to know when will that particular piece be communicated? And I'm asking these questions because these were things that were determined as we have to have these things in place before the opening of the schools. And I just want to know where we're at with these things. Mike three and Mike 16, can you just turn them both on? Okay, so when a staff member um, has been exposed or test positive, they'll report to the uh, incident commander at the building level. And that building level coordinator will uh, then communicate immediately with the contact tracer at the building level, who will have a script prepared by our regional response team. And they'll immediately contact that individual, interview them, and then the contact tracer calls the regional response team. And the regional response team guides the building on uh, what the response will be. They'll, they've drafted letters um, and they'll determine based on that interview by the contact tracer which letter would go to each individual. Okay, so the privacy issues with this are, people can know that someone tested positive, but the privacy issues involved would be, you can't state a name because there's the issue, privacy issues with that. Is that the only privacy issue we're dealing with, with this or? Well, within you know HIPAA, re HIPAA requirements, we've got to follow those. So, yeah, a person would privacy would be maintained. Now that individual could determine uh, that it's in the best interest of their team to share that information. And so, if if I were that individual and tested positive or had a prolonged exposure, I could inform the rest of my team. That'd be my decision. I c I can violate my own. It wouldn't be a violation, but I but I can determine who I want to let know. And I think in, uh, as we've had incidents, and it, for the most part, that's how it has played out. People have told their teams, uh, we need to respect their privacy and we wouldn't share that information. Okay, thank Lisa, you. Lisa, anything you want to add to that? Well, I think that's pretty comprehensive. All right. So do we have a system in place for the staff and families to self-report? We do. We've developed a, a Google form that they can access right from the website and report. And then that will generate an email immediately to the COVID response team at the building and they'll be able to begin the contact tracing immediately. So and the regional response team is the regional response team provided by the state? Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, so what will be the system for notifying staff, family, and the public about a COVID positive on school premises? Sure. It would be, it would be the direction of the, of the regional response team. So they'll have letters prepared for each category of person. They'll determine the level of risk, and then that will determine the level, the communication that will be sent to each, each individual or each stakeholder. Will this be um, electronic mail? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, different topic. So, um, received a, an email from a teacher today that I thought was um, interesting. So, the, our teachers are, are tier one. Their, their children are considered part of the, the tier one essential workers. And we have other tier one essential workers and their kids come to extended days. So, on their off days, um, they would be potentially within whatever school they're at. Are those kids potentially going to be in classrooms on the days that, say they go Monday, Wednesday, 
would they potentially be in classrooms Thursday or Tuesday Thursday uh, yes is Christina here Christina Thier Anderson here she got her way up Um, so, excuse me one second. I'm sorry. I'm Can sorry. you identify yourself, please, for the yes. for the record? Yeah. So sorry, uh, Christina Thayer Anderson. I'm our youth programs coordinator from Community Ed. Thank you. Um, to answer your question, yes, our teachers are part of our Tier One Essential Workers Group. Um, our goal is to try to keep all of our students in their classrooms as much as possible. So. Um, all of our principals right now are working to try to figure out all their capacities and the number of students, <coughs> excuse me, the number of students that they would be able to accept on their off days. So in your example of my student is an A student, they come Monday, Wednesday, but I'm a tier one worker and therefore I'd like them to be in school Tuesday, Thursday because I need to come to work. Ideally, it would be great to think that they'd be able to fit into our classrooms. At the same time, we, as Ange mentioned, are currently getting all of our final counts and we are unable to determine our final capacities and how many students we would be able to fit um, of those tier one essential workers until we have the final numbers of all of the students that have chosen to be in distance learning or in our hybrid model. Don't we end up with an equity issue by doing this? By having them participate in the classroom, whereas I have a third, I, I don't have a third grade. If I had a third grader and my, my child goes Monday, Wednesday, but they're home the other days, but if I'm a tier one worker, that child could potentially be in all of those days. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I can bring up is yes, that has been discussed. Um, one of the concerns we also have is that this um, mandated opportunity for all of our essential workers, we have a serious space issue as well. And so um, if we have seats available in a classroom, this allows us to serve as many tier one essential worker working students as we possibly can where we don't have space elsewhere. Um, we are working to try to lease space in the community. Um, but that brings up a, a lot of other issues as I'm sure you can imagine as well. Um, but this will hopefully allow us to serve as many students as possible um, in the spaces that we currently have where we also know that we have the resources to serve them to our fullest capacity as compared to moving to an off-campus location. Um, but we do have multiple off-campus locations that we've also toured um, and that we're working through lease contracts um, as well because we won't even have the space in all of our classrooms for our tier one workers okay um, all right I'll, I'll move on from that but I think that potentially is well, it's been 13 uh, it's been uh, you know it's a requirement school districts must provide uh, that service yeah. and and so we're figuring out how to do that and it's not perfect no it's absolutely but there's no way to there's no way to provide the child care in a separate site or or separate sites to the level that we're being uh, that we'd be required to do unless we um, utilize existing space and existing staffing there's no there's no other way to do it okay thank you um, one last question. So if we we'll bring her back up, Dr. Neumeister. If, uh, if we delay until September 14th, is that something we're going to have to vote on? Or we, you guys can just say? Uh, I mean, I, you certainly can, but I was just thinking we would move ahead with that. 
Okay. Um, you certainly. So we're really only making it, having to make up for five days throughout the entire Well, before. Year. And uh, not necessarily mm -hmm. for at each grade level because there's, you know, it's a staggered start. So, but, but anyway, we, we would probably look at using a portion of the allotted days for transition during the year. So maybe we wouldn't be doing the full four, but we might do, you know, try to find two or three to make up for it. For okay. The year. All right. Thank you, everyone. Ms. Bloyd, are you second? You good? Yep, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thompson, Mike. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, you had asked about the contact tracing and how people will be notified. And um, if it is a low risk exposure, it'll be notification through email. If it's a high risk exposure, it'll be notification via voice drop. Again? Voice drop. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Thompson, mic 11, please. Um, first, I would like to just uh, thank all the teachers who are here today. Uh, we appreciate you and everything you do. Um, I have a lot of things, and I don't know where to start, but I'll start with one thing, um, and maybe it's just a oversight or there's a reason why, um, but there is a couple mask is issues here currently in the board meeting um, and this brings to mind if teachers are in the classroom teaching and they have to take their mask off every time they talk to students yet we up here have microphones and we keep taking our masks off every time we talk um, and then the requirement to wear the mask properly, which is something we are going to be teaching all of our children to do, um, and I have already been doing this, is to wear it covering your nose, covering your mouth, covering every part of this portion that can uh, bring the aspirations into the air. Um, if we can't even do that, that, that brings um, a lot of questions to mind how we are going to expect uh, it to happen in the classroom. Um, if we have a mask, do we have a rule that we have to wear a mask in, in our buildings, like currently right now? Yep. Yeah. So um, we have one member not wearing a mask, one um, person sitting here with the mask under their nose this whole meeting. And then how far apart are we all currently distanced? Did we measure how far? Because I feel like we're farther than six feet apart, but I could be wrong. I mean, my perception of distance isn't the best. Does somebody know how far apart we are currently? Six foot seven inches. Six foot seven inches. Um, and then we're all in a big circle. Instead of being placed as the you know, way desks would be placed, I guess I have. Um, it just seems to me that this is a very big stage. There's a lot more space up here than many of the classrooms I have been in, and I'm um, concerned that we will be able to actually follow um, the guidelines. I have communication from a teacher who was told today that in her um, A model for kindergarten class, she will have 17 students. And in the B model, she will have 15 students. That currently includes um, tier one students being placed in her classroom. Um, and that is a lot more than the, what, 11 to 13, or what was our number we were trying to stick to? Do we have a number? Depends on the room. Depends on the room. Um, I just, you know, if, if a normal kindergarten classroom had 21 to 22 students in it, 17 to 15 is not a 50% student ratio. I understand that we have more things than we can possibly manage um, and that we have to help these tier one students because we've been required to by the state. There are um, other districts who are you know, and I don't know, this is a spacing issue. I understand this up in Hugo and Onika, we are building a new school because we don't have enough room for all of the students we have up there currently. So I don't know where we would 
put these kids. I, I get that whole part, but that just makes me question more the method or the path that we're currently on. There have been great um, models proposed by our teachers, at least that I have heard from, and I know that we can't do this on every level, um, and some of our buildings don't have the extra staffing um, to handle it, but, um, and I, I know it's been proposed to people, but I did like the, um, a teacher who contacted me and said that, you know, in their building, they have seven kindergarten teachers. So they could do six teachers would take the AB students. One teacher would take all the tier one students as well as the um, distant learner kids. And then, um, or actually, that, I'm sorry, that's not right. The tier one kids would still be divided up throughout the classroom. But that other teacher would take all the distant learner kids and one model, whether it be the A or the B model. Some of our schools don't have the staffing to do that, but, and I don't know how, this is just more complicated stuff, but is there a way? I just, I really have concern over, over getting emails from staff who have um, health issues and have, to me, what I have seen response-wise, um, have not been given very good options. You know, they could be distant learner teachers, they don't feel comfortable going in the classroom because whether they have diabetes or they're in the age range that is um, at a higher susceptibility of getting, you know, seriously sick with COVID. Um, and they, it, from what I have seen, it doesn't appear that we are supporting them in those. It's either, well then, you know, take medical leave, but that's not what they want to do. Where I, I see a need for having teachers who could do it take those distance learners? Is there um, a reason why we can't do it that way? And then that brings me to just thinking that this deadline of extending it to the 14th, if we feel the need like we need to do that, which I feel the need like we need to make it go a little farther, um, I guess one question I would have is, um, are teachers going to be teaching curriculum from day one? Because I have heard opposite of that. I, I have a teacher who said they were told that they should not expect to be teaching curriculum for the first month of school. I, I don't, that they would be more handling kids coming into the classroom and like, figuring out how to work the classroom, how to wear masks, how do we social distance, how do we do all these things and not actually teaching curriculum. And that could be wrong, but that is a couple of the communications that I have heard. 14, those are specialist teachers that have emailed you about that and we're still working through that? that no, it was actually on the grade level. Then that's incorrect. Okay, because that could be like, I mean that, just doesn't um, seem like it would be a good thing. Um, I guess another question along with that is, um, we are no longer using pullout services this year. Is that true? Say more about that, pullout services for what? So the kindergarten teachers that I have spoke with a couple have been told um, with their students, as an example, their ASD students, um, and this conscious discipline training, which I know we're gonna speak to in a little bit, um, have been told that they will not, those students in the past would have been pulled out of the classroom when they were having, you know, whatever it was, a reaction to something, um, and they're having a behavioral issue, that they would get pulled out of the classroom in the past, and this year we are not pulling them out of the classroom. I can speak to that. Um, so each individual student, dependent on what their behavior is, our first goal is to try to support them in the least restrictive environment. So. When we say pulling them out, what we're really trying to do is support them within their classroom. And if they can't be managed in the classroom, then we take them through a series of routines to help them regulate outside of the classroom. Um, that is still happening. We're planning on that. Uh, and conscious discipline is just one extra tool on how you can do that. Okay, so if the teacher is teaching their hybrid students in the classroom while being live video, to teach the distance learners who are at home and said child 
has an issue that teacher's responsibility in a normal classroom would be to handle and try to get the student to get back into the routine without needing to be pulled out. Um, but that's in a normal classroom environment. We are, this will not be that environment. Um, and that's all gonna be live video fed from my understanding. You know, these students can be anything from just having a meltdown to um, violent reactions, and it will be um, caught for the families at home to see. Um, and then the teacher has to deal with that child while now abandoning all the other kids to focus on that child. Yeah, so I would say that it's not anything different than we do in a traditional environment. We always try to embed within our schools different responses to student behavior on an individual basis. And so if there was something that was controlled through a Google Meet and a student from distance learning was looking into that class and there was a behavior, one of the protocols that we would be teaching is that they would turn off their uh, camera at that time and the sound and they would go in and support the student. And if the student couldn't be supported in that way, we would do our normal protocol and have special education staff come and support that student. Okay, um, I, I see a lot of complications with that and a lot of things that, that could go wrong. Um, and I understand the concerns the teachers have because they will be the ones who will have the backlash that comes at them for any of the situations that happen in the classroom, inclu including the possibility of, um, you know, are we breaking privacy issues or um, now is the student who has um, emotional behavioral problems or whatever it may be uh, even more called out because where the community as a whole wouldn't necessarily see that before, <laughs> you are now, I mean, even if they turn the live feed off, whoever was already watching at home <laughs> has concerns. Sure, so in special education, all our students have a right to be in the classroom and all of our parents expect that if that's what the IEP team determined, that that student is gonna be in the classroom and if they don't feel like they want somebody, they understand the ramifications that you're talking about, that there might be a distance learner that might see that behavior, but most parents that I've talked to assume that that would have happened in a traditional classroom anyways, and so maybe that student would go home and tell their mom or dad that Lisa had an escalation and tipped over a desk or something, whether that's viewed through a distance learning format or within the classroom. Most of our parents uh, who have chosen to come to school expect their students to have their IEPs implemented as written. Oh, and I completely agree that they sh should be yeah. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Those are not the parents and the families that I am actually concerned with having you know, it's the families who don't understand and don't have students mm -hmm. with those issues that will see that. They're the ones, I guess, that I'm more concerned with what issues they're gonna have. And I just, I, I feel like the, so is the live streaming gonna be the whole entire day of the hybrid learning minus, you know, lunch and, or is it a portion of the day? Like just the morning, the first hour, we're not live streaming. Live streaming is when it's open to the public and it's an open event. And so if a teacher chooses as part of a synchronous learning opportunity to invite a group of students to a, to a Google Meet, so that it would be just like we did send an invite, it would be for a portion of a mini lesson. It wouldn't, it would, you know, the time frame would be, you know, Jen maybe can tell about the parameters, but minimal because even for students to pay attention at home and how they engage at home, you'd want it to be meaningful and then it would be part of those learning frameworks. So it absolutely would not be open ended. That's not, even, that is not, it's not live streaming period. It is an invite through Google Meet that the teacher would set up with the student as part of a synchronous learning opp opportunity. Okay, so it wouldn't be like every day um, you sign on via, you know, the invite at the same time for the same portion of the class, it's gonna be more of a... They could every day if they wanted to have an invite for a, por a, a mini lesson if they chose that. They could also say, here's a pre-recorded lesson. There's opportunities for them to look at what type of synchronous learning opportunities that they're choosing. So there's, there's options there for them okay. through the flexible learning Well, framework. so then there's, I guess, obviously a mis 
understanding on maybe my part and on their part um, on the live video stream so that it's good they don't have to use them or they do have like do they have to use them every day or they can just do uh, like pre-recorded or Jen can you talk more about the synchronous learning opportunities Jen Babish teaching and learning um, yeah great question I, so we, we want our students to be able to have touch points with their teachers synchronously, but that could look very differently. It could be a mini lesson, for example, at the elementary that would maybe be three minutes long that we would invite our distance learners to, to view um, or to be part of that meet. Um, or it could be, you know, I think it's really going to be teacher kind of um, leading that to really feel like working with their, their grade level teams to figure out how that would work. Um, there, there will be times, I think, where maybe the touch point is just, I'm going to check in with this um, student one-on-one, -on -one, maybe in a synchronous meeting, to check in on possibly a mini lesson that they watched um, with an instructional video, and now maybe we do a, a we do together, which may last, you know, three to five minutes or, you know, ten minutes. Um, you know, Fridays, we know, is, is a time for students to be able to, to work um, asynchronously but that may also be a time where teachers can touch base with kids as well that may need additional support or help um, and so it I think to have a clear cut it's going to be done one way or the other I think um, you know is really hard and um, you know our teacher teams are really working thoughtfully to try to think through what that could look like and using that gradual release I think has really helped kind of frame how those lessons could look and um, last Monday we we met um, K-12 and um, looked to define what our essential learning standards would be recognizing that um, we, we won't be able to have um, the same amount of content that we would if we were in person and so um, you know teachers now have time to look at um, they, they're determining their essential learning standards for the year in the different subject areas and then determining which assessments to to see if students can um, see where they are with their learning along the way and then um, that I think as as a team they're really determining that and then the next steps we're meeting with our um, curriculum leaders our department leaders our um, teacher leaders and um, determining then what that instruction looks like so helping teachers to support them um, next will be with their lesson plans now that they they have um, figured out what that essential learning um, will be for the school year great thank you uh, so that then would bring me into an email we received um, where it seemed so if I just read the communication is that okay um, because it's the only way that I guess I can ask the it kind of follows up to that is um, they are saying that they appreciate the administration and they're willing to help them figure out their um, learning uh, well let's see here uh, regardless of the learning format hybrid or distance every student needs to have at least two live touch points with the content teacher per week so for the hybrid students those would take place on the days that they come to school on the days that they do not come to school it is expected that the hybrid students are working independently on assignments for the class the touch points for distance students may take a number of forms including joining the hybrid class via hangouts or meeting with their teacher um, and the teacher content area during a different part of the day and then touch points for distance students have been challenging to figure out I'm happy to help individuals and departments with brainstorming that was the communication that came to them via their building uh, so then they would like to know um, uh, you know that they're happy that the administration is willing to help them figure it out but they feel that it is the district's job to do that um, scheduling the class is not their job uh, I believe their job is more creating the learning boards and the curriculum you know that they're going to teach in their class so now they are um, kind of feel like they're just being told to figure it out uh, um, it, including many emails that have come about the space in the rooms and the teachers being in charge of figuring out how to make that space work 
and moving furniture uh, that they can't put anywhere else because there's nowhere for it to go. Um, I just, I guess I, I mean, I don't really maybe have a question. I just wonder how, to me, I think on the elementary level, it looks as if things could be figured out a lot easier than they can on the secondary level. Um, I feel like a week is a great starting point for additional time, um, but it is not enough time. I don't, we have had how many meetings now? We have all asked multiple questions. We have gotten answers, but we've had more questions come because they continually keep coming and even the answers we get don't 100% answer the question, at least not to a satisfactory level. Where So I think on my own personal level, I have been working in my office um, pretty much the whole time. But I only work with one other person in my office. We have a building with other offices in it. Um, they have all been pretty much shut down, people coming in you know, certain days and others coming in other days. When we are together, we wear our masks, we social distance the best we can. So then it, you know, and I had issues with going back into my office. And like I said, I don't have a lot of people that I'm exposed to. I don't feel comfortable. I don't think that we have a plan in place that makes me feel that if I was a teacher, I would be comfortable going into the classroom. Um, with that said, I also feel that our students really need to be back in school. Um, and I think we can do it. But I think we need more teacher input. And I feel like we need teachers to be more actively involved in all of the planning. And, and that is not taken away from all of the hard work that everybody on the administration has done because I know that you have all worked tirelessly on this. And I know that you are all very kind and caring individuals and, and this is a subject that is just as stressful for all of you as it is for everybody else. I feel like we need more time. And there, I, I, I have, um, the last meeting we had, I literally didn't eat the entire day. I couldn't. I felt like I made a bad decision. Um, and I have not been able to forget it. And I want my kids to school. My um, oldest one has chosen to do distance learning because she feels, A, that sitting in a classroom for 110 minutes is, I mean, she has concentration issues. So we actually received emails from students who have asked us to shorten the class time because they uh, will get bored. They will lose their concentration. They'll lose their focus. Um, and these are, one of the students is somebody who takes AP in the CIS classes. So I would imagine that they are a student who works really hard and, um, you know, it wouldn't say that it was an issue unless they knew it was an issue. And then you get to this uh, drop-off schedule that we have released where we will have a 40-minute time period where kids will be coming in for 40, 45 minutes. And where are they going? They're going to the classroom, and then the teacher is losing all of that pre-morning prep time, or are they now just, um, and I don't even want to say it that way, but are they just now child care providers for that part of the day? Um, I've also heard suggestions of, you know, extending it to the MEA break. I, I don't feel like, I feel like that's m more time than is needed if we can commit to uh, extending it longer. Now, I don't think kids should have to not be in school. I don't understand why we can't start the year out in the distance learning format for, I mean, even if we did it through, you know, to the, I was trying to figure out via the calendar how we could do it just for the month of September. And then start school in that first part of October, um, or even just two weeks. 
I, I have too many concerns and there are too many questions and they are all very valid and the more data that comes out and I have researched from all different formats and I know that there are parents who um, are begging us to get their kids back in school. I completely agree. I want my children back in school. Um, I just don't feel like it's safe to do it in the format that we're doing, and that isn't even bringing up questions about my reading about this Clorox 360 disinfectant spray that we are gonna be asking our custodial staff um, to use, and all of the requirements and the, that's a whole nother, um, subject. So I guess I'd, I, I mean, I could ask a million questions and I would still have more questions to ask. So I guess I will just, I, I'll just leave it at that, I guess. Dr. Kazmierczak, do you want to answer or you, how do you want to handle that? I'm not. Mike 13, please. I'm not sure what specific question you want answered at this point. I, I, is there a way, I guess, that we could reconsider our start time and, um, I mean, a week is, is a great way to start, <laughs> but I don't think it's enough time. And I guess I would wonder, I mean, if I'm the lone one on this idea, then that's fine and I will completely support what we have already decided and I will do my best to make it work and I will help in any way that I can. Um, I just wonder how everybody else uh, feels about it, I guess. So uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, go to the, the Dr. Arcan because he was the next one that asked the question and we can kind of work it through there and then if other board members want to comment, they can. Dr. Arcan? Okay. Mike um, six, please. I just have a couple of questions that I think that to kind of flow with what we've been talking about. I know last Thursday um, I watched a candidate forum and I heard uh, continuing issues with airflow and I thought we'd address them. There seems to be some misunderstanding or some concern that we don't have the airflow we need specifically for the inner rooms at North Campus and rooms here at Central Middle School with the two big ones that I've heard. That's the first question I have. And the second question is, um, there seems to be some questions about what PPE equipment will be issued to teachers and what they are gonna have to purchase on their own. Um, and I know we've talked about these, so I thought we could just restate what we're doing. And that's all I needed, thank you. I know Mr. Rosier's in the room, if he wouldn't mind. Dan, you wanna come up and sit in the hot seat? Can you turn on mic 17, please? Because I have some questions too, Dan. So if you want to just sit right there at 17, that would be appreciated. So do you want to talk about the ventilation system? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, at our secondary buildings, our ventilation systems are quite old. Um, we have worked, started working with Hallberg Engineering and our maintenance team have partnered up with them. And since it could, Pretty much all summer, that's been our big task for our maintenance team, is making sure everything's running, filters are clean, coils are clean, they've been up on roofs, checking exhaust fans, making sure everything's running. If something they found wasn't running, they've got a contractor over here to get it running right away. So we're, we're very confident that our systems are running as designed. And it is true that our systems are old, but the thing with the old systems, they don't have the modern controls like we do at our elementary schools, so they don't have the CO2 sensors, the static pressure sensors that sense when filters are dirty. But they do allow outside air to come in. We can open dampers up 100% this time of year and allow as much outside air as that system can pull in. So our systems are pulling in air, the filters are clean. We've looked at upgrading to MERV 13 filters as recommended, so many of our filters have been upgraded on the systems that can support it. Some systems can't support MERV 13 filters, it just slows down the airflow and it kind of chokes off your outside air. 
but in situations where it would support a MRF 13 filter, we, we've worked that way. And then after our uh, maintenance team went through everything, we decided a couple weeks ago when we, we, when we found out we were going back to the hybrid model to partner up with Hallberg Engineering and we asked them to go through our same system. So room by room, they've been checking unit events at all the schools, they've been checking our air handling units at all the schools, just to make sure there's any little tweaks they can do to, to get even more airflow coming through. And they have found some small things and, and they have uh, Marge, I, I'd like you to go over to the library over at North Campus where we put a streamer up on one of the vents and you can actually see that thing whistling now. That, that the guys actually climbed inside, they cut holes to get the coils clean that have probably haven't been cleaned in ever since the building. Since 1965. Yeah, so since 1965 and they cut access holes in some of the air handlers so they could crawl inside and clean coils. and check to make sure the dampers were functioning properly. So we've made some improvements. How about the inside rooms though? Those are killer. Inside rooms too, they, they've been working on some inside air handlers and they've made some minor improvements. Hopefully, hopefully we're getting more airflow, but Mr. Wald has purchased some air purifiers too. So if we do continue to have some problem areas, that's them are areas where we, we would put an air purifier to help. How do we know where there's a problem area though? We'll usually hear about it. That's, that's our first. Well, that would be hot, but I'm just thinking the amount of airflow that exchanges air is what we really need to know. Is there any way you have to reassure people and say, we're having complete airflow, you know, all these articles say how often it should happen. And part of it depends on what you're doing. If you're playing a band, and that's a totally different thing than a class that's sitting reading something. Yeah, and different rooms are designed for different things. I was actually talking to one of the mechanical engineers at Hallberg today and asked them how often should our air turn over in our classrooms. And their current designs are anywhere from four to eight times per hour. And in our elementary schools, they're all fairly current systems and I'm confident we're getting that flow. In our older buildings with 100% dampers opening, we're probably coming close to that. Hopefully we're gonna supplement that with windows being open to, to improve that even more. But, out, but interior rooms we will have to keep an eye on and there is CO2 testing we can have done in some of our interior rooms. Usually this time of year, especially if you cut down on student populations in a room, you won't have real high CO2 levels. But then as we get into winter and we've gotta choke down that outside air coming in, then we're really gonna to have to keep an eye on CO2 levels. And we've got uh, companies we work with to come in and do testing, so we can, we can keep a pretty good gauge of that, I think. I'm gonna ask a foolish question, but what does the CO2 level have to do with the outer inner air exchange to reassure the person that their air really is moving enough to get the, the virus out of the room if there is any there? If you see a high CO2 level, that means you're not getting enough outside air coming in to exchange that air. So you'll smell it too. It, the room will smell stale. And well, they do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Dr. Yeah. Newmaster, if you don't mind, I want to let Dr. Arcan finish his questions and then I'll get you on the list. I just want to make sure that his questions are continue to get mm -hmm. answered. Please. The, the only other one we had was what PPE equipment is being issued to teachers. Mike three, please. I can answer that. So uh, masks, there'll be masks provided for, several cloth masks provided for each teacher and student as, long, as well as about five disposable masks that we'll have available for staff and students. Uh, plastic, plastic shield masks will be provided for each teacher, for each staff member. We have about 2,400 of those. Uh, as you remember, the governor said he he would invest in some uh, masks and shields. So we're counting those in. We're picking those up tomorrow. Those came in a little earlier than we thought they might. We have uh, N95 and KN95 masks uh, that are available. Uh, our custodians who are using the electrostatic sprayers have been, um, I'll have those. And then we have them available for people who um, would choose to wear one. Uh, we have some cl clear mask for students who might need it, hearing impaired students in, in an environment where that would be necessary for our ASL students where 
Um, facial expressions matter in terms of being able to communicate effectively with ASL. Um, plastic barriers, uh, we've ordered, uh, uh, I think we're close to 200 plastic barriers for high traffic areas. Those will all be available. And most of those are placed, the rest are just coming in. Rubber gloves for every classroom, dis disinfectant spray, hand sanitizer, soap where there's a sink. We have disposable gowns uh, where we have staff who, uh, who might need those, might be in a, a special ed area where there's toileting or in a uh, nurse's office. Thank you, I yield the floor back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Dr. Hercan. I have uh, several questions, if you guys don't mind. Um, so I was uh, definitely interested in the ventilation system. And before, um, did, when you talked to Holberg's uh, engineering, did they talk about particles uh, that are let through? Uh, did they talk about the filtering system? On, do they make any recommendations on when those filters should be changed? And do we have enough filters to be able to do so? Yes, they did recommend you change filters more often just because the pressure changes. If, if a filter builds up with dust or debris, it's going to let less air through, so they did recommend them changing them more often. Or actually, we have in the past, we've changed filters three times a year. We're going to go to every eight weeks on our filter changes just so we're not restricting airflow and we're getting as much push through possible. And Hallberg thought that was a, a good, good start for us. Also, uh, you know, as, as you've been hearing tonight, right, we've got a, a tremendous amount of communication and phone calls and emails uh, regarding, uh, you know, concerns that the staff has, that parents have. Um, one of the things that was brought to uh, my attention or our attention uh, was the cleaning of the classrooms um, and the fact that maybe a custodian is not able to touch every classroom every night. Um, is there a plan in place to uh, achieve that or uh, to, and if it is, can you share some of those so, so that there Absolutely. can be some? Yeah, yes, we've got good practice with the five extended day sites and the one summer school site. And things are different for custodians. And until they experience it, until the extended day sites experienced it and Lincoln over at summer school experienced, I don't think the custodians really got it that their job is different now. Sure, they're going to clean, but the number one priority is disinfecting and sanitizing classrooms. So in the past where they do their cleaning routine, they'd get their trash, they'd get their bathrooms, vacuum their rooms. Right now, the focus is on disinfecting. So I've been telling the custodians that I'm meeting with every custodian in our district as we start get preparing now is things are different for you. We know you, you only have eight hours in your shift, and we're putting all this enhanced disinfecting, as you've heard. We're not expecting you to vacuum rooms every night. We're not expecting you to sweep rooms every night. We need for you to get in a new routine where you're getting your trash, you're getting your bathrooms, you're getting your hallways, and then you're doing a couple hours of extra disinfecting with the electrostatic sprayers where you're going through every classroom every bathroom, every night, spraying down the, the high touch point areas that we're gonna identify. So it's true, we're not gonna be able to vacuum every room every night. The custodians aren't gonna be able to sweep every night, but they are gonna be able to disinfect every night. Okay. Uh, Dr. Newmaster, thank you. All right, thank you also. I've got the usual random questions, but they kind of build on what people have already said. Is this mic on? I can't tell from here. Mm -hmm. Okay. The ubiquitous mask question. I can tell you I've been wearing masks pretty religiously when I go out. I have two pre-existing conditions, so I'm serious about masks. And most of the people that I interact with are. We're adults. We're pretty careful about our masks. They don't last. I can tell you, I had the greatest mask I just bought. I washed it a few times, said vote, vote, vote. And the little ear elastics already fell off. The disposable ones, I can't even make them last a day. So when you look at the number of masks to expect full compliance that a classroom teacher is gonna have to have available to hand somebody, or 
um, maybe you can fix the mask with a uh, safety pin or something, they aren't going to last with kids because I think I'm pretty careful. I was really disappointed when the, my favorite one went, went to pieces. Um, so I think we're going to need more masks and I know that the Korean government sent all Korean adoptees um, a pack of 50 N94s to start the school year with. Their kids all wear masks and did during normal flu season and they expect it to be pretty steadily replacing them with decent quality masks. And if we expect compliance and kids fiddle, just like you all are taking your masks off and on, those little rubber bands come off. So that's just a reality if we're gonna expect compliance that we're gonna have to have some on hand in every classroom more than five. Um, Another question I had, thinking of being a classroom teacher, and when I heard that the tier one kids, whenever possible, were gonna be put in their classroom, in effect, to be babysat for two days, because they're gonna be repeating the lessons they've already had. And I thought of the times that I had kids repeat, say, German three, and they're sitting in the class where it's already been taught. It takes a creative teacher and you have different act activities for them, but that's asking a one more thing of the teacher. And if we don't have a place to do daycare for these kids, because the last time we did it, none of our kids were in school, I can understand you've got a space problem. But it's also a real problem for the teacher, as much as she may love these kids, to have them two days in a row for the same lesson. So, and that's your distant students Two, when you think repetition, and we talk about repeating, but I'm sure you've thought about that, so I just wonder what, if you're gonna have another whole level of things that those kids are gonna do. Um, so masks, repetition, the fact that we'll have learning loss with the block, that is the chosen way to do. When you do something for a month and you don't do it, I don't know what you've done with classes like language and orchestra and band that need daily. So you have an answer for that? I wouldn't want to see our whole music program destroyed with the block system. Um, Back to Newmaster, if you may. Uh, Mr. Wald, can you can tell us, I want to answer some of those before we get too far into asking them. So if you'll just bear with me one second. About ordering masks, do we continue to purchase additional masks moving forward? Yeah, there will be ordering more masks. There's no shortage of mask providers out there right now. We get about 20 to 25 emails a day from vendors trying to sell us masks. So we have about 50,000 disposables um, in stock. Uh, so I suspect we're probably going to get another 50,000. And if, if need be, we'll get another 50,000 after that. And if you look at the quality of the mask, you know, the paper ones don't last. And you're also gonna have kids coming with a bandana they think will do. You're gonna have to decide. And the ones that they just kind of pull up that are a neck thing, what kind of masks? I can see secondary kids. You're gonna say, what, what counts as a mask? So that's just something to, to make the quality. I remember, what's a hat? What's a hood? You know, that sort of thing. And the compliance thing. If you've got a replacement, it helps. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a replacement, you could be infecting everyone in a, in a classroom. Um, so, the, and then the sec your second question was regarding something that we had discussed. I think there needs to be some, can you please repeat it? I wanna just make sure we're getting through these, eh? and I'm not trying to right. rush you. I think that was when I talked about what we're doing with the tier one kids. And I think there needs to be some follow up there. Um, and I think that that's, I think that it was answered, but then there, I believe there needs to be a little bit of follow up, correct? I, I'm, I'm thinking that that's, that's a specific problem that exemplifies some of the other problems that we're getting. People are working on it, and there's a lot of floating models and I'm thinking the classroom teacher, that's another big thing to think about, to suddenly discover you've got three or four kids that have already done everything twice in your classroom. So 
maybe Ms. And Babish I is coming up to answer that one. She knows it. Thanks. Um, Jen Babish, Teaching and Learning. So Mar um, Dr. M Newmaster, I think that's a great question. They're, they will not be repeating lessons, and so it will be lessons Monday through Thursday, and then that touch point on Friday if it's relearning or independent learning. And so the model that we have with the gradual release will allow for if we're at distance learning, hybrid learning, if kids are in front of us or at home, that they will be able to have a continuous lesson throughout the week, and so we will not be repeating any lessons to any groups of kids. Hmm. So your teacher makes a four-day lesson plan, and A and B get day one and three, or whatever. Yep. So um, you know, it's and, and this is this is good because this is kind of the the talk that we're having with the the teachers as well. So as we look at that, that first quarter, that essential learning, um, is roughly about 22 days, four weeks. And so talking with teachers, we talked about, well, even if we broke it off into a week, what could that essential learning, what would that um, time be in a week that you would do a lesson? And then we know that lessons um, are gonna vary depending on the student's needs. And so those formative assessments, those check for understandings, could possibly, you know, maybe there's uh, a concept that takes only three days, and then maybe there's a concept that would take five or six days, depending on the kids' learning. And so we're trying to do kind of that backwards design as well to kind of say what is our overall essential learning standards, and then to work backwards with those assessments and try to chunk those out. But um, so kids will be getting a different lesson. Um, each day, but that may look different. It may be an instructional video. It may be collaboration work with their uh, peers over Google Meet. And so um, that will vary based on the student's needs. Well, that, that clarifies it. And it also tells me that the learning boards that you're creating are there, whether you're doing hybrid or we make a turn on a dime and we're distance. So if we decide to start later with hybrid, we could start with what you've worked on already for distance. Because I think that's what North St. Paul sounds like they're doing now. They're gonna do a soft start. So we, the, the model was very intentional so that if we did have to flip on a dime for whatever model, if it's distance or if it's um, hybrid, that we could make that switch pretty easily and so our students wouldn't see that impact from that transition. So what you've been working on now works for any model? Correct. Okay. Do you have anything else, Dr. Newmaster? Well, I've just had, I'm gonna just summarize it this way. I have a lot of questions about safety issues. There's a lot of things that aren't that are still kind of fluid and, and they're being worked on creatively. But I see other districts that are starting with distance and moving in to hybrid. And now it looks like we're starting to maybe think about starting a little bit later. I'm just wondering, have we ever given serious consideration to starting? And when you've got all your pieces together and it's clear to parents as well as teachers what's happening, you move. Because I know that's what Rochester decided to do. So I'm just curious, how many, and the paper keeps trying to keep us up with what's happening. Are we, are we trying to match what everyone's doing? Are we looking at the fact that we're mostly Ramsey County, where Anoka, I don't know what they're up to right now, but they're a lot more rural. So, I mean, we can't balance it that way, but I guess that's a question for Dr. K. You're asking what our data are for Ramsey County? We're well, at our two, week, our two week figure is at the 22, which is on the low end of the 20 to 30 range, which indicates hybrid K-12. 
that would be the best that we would do. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but we don't have to do hybrid as some are doing distance and they're doing hybrid with different grades or whatever. Correct. Well, I just have some questions about how we're dealing with contact points, safety, and it just feels like the clock is ticking and school is starting in days. And even if you postpone it to the 14th, we've gained four days after Labor Day. I don't know how much difference that makes, if everything will be clear or if we should start a little later. I'm, I know we made the, voice, the vote and I truly thought with all the pieces in play, it, you know, I like to believe and be positive, things will be clear. But I think there's so many people with questions out there and so many unfinished things, I kind of feel like Angela, but I, I know it comes down to Dr. Kazmierczak. Thank you, Dr. Newmaster. Is that? I guess so. Thank you. Mr. Chapman? In terms of the, uh, Mike, uh, eight, please. In terms of the learning boards, and I, I don't know who will speak to this, but um, just wondering when those are going to be finalized. Uh, if we were to continue on at the path we're going and remain starting on the eighth, and it sounds like we may not, um, but when are those boards slated to be finalized? I know there's been some expression that uh, they need to get finalized sooner rather than later, and I'm just curious as to when that uh, when that's slated to be. Yeah, we were actually just talking about that today, and our goal, like we have shared the learning boards with all of our elementary teachers now, so they all have the template, the draft template, and we've been instructing them that they absolutely can use that template to start thinking and planning and creating and you know looking within that and, and we don't think that we're going to have many tweaks to it the the whole purpose for waiting was to make sure that we got it right and to get a lot of input and not um, burden teachers with having to do work before they were back on the 31st so that was our original plan you know to wait but you know right now we're moving up you know kind of our timeline as you know when we can pull teachers together and get them to look at it again and then get it in the hands of the finalized product in the hands of teachers as soon as humanly possible, which would be early next week. So that's our goal. But I, I met with my teachers today and said, you know, here it is. Go ahead and start thinking about how you can create and put material on there. But that that learning board is more of just the landing platform for where to house lessons and activities that you're already going to be creating. So it's just a way to think. I'm gonna, so now I kind of have the, the out, the picture of it. So now I can start creating the lessons and then I can input them and put them on that learning board as soon as I have them done. So they do all have that template right now that they can play around with and look at. So, but our finalized product we think is not gonna change too much and should be in their hands early, early next week. Okay, That's thank plan. you. Mm -hmm. Any other? Are there any other questions? I know that there's still a lot of things that need to be worked out, and I know, oh, Mr. Chapman, I'm sorry. Just uh, one other question. Um, what, if anything, are we looking to do as far as uh, cutting out any extraneous uh, commitments or, or things required of staff? Uh, I know there was an email that uh, I think all of us in this room received or on the stage here relative to a suggestion of reducing the time spent on convocation, for example, some things like that. Um, has any thought been given to that to free up more time uh, for the staff to, uh, to do what is needed for the classroom development in this situation? Mike 14, please. That week really is for the buildings, I can't speak to whether convocation is shorter. I don't remember the exact time, but in terms of historically, we've had more district PD and really there isn't any. There's one 
hour and a half session around equity that I asked that buildings um, complete by the end of September. And so trying to be flexible with time on that Friday. And if we need to be even more flexible, we can. But it's around um, some really exciting work that we have in equity, but that's the only district PD that we would have. So, and talked with principals about defaulting to as much work time as possible and building professional development to support being ready for our hybrid model. So there's no other district PD that week. Mike, 13, please. Convocation will go on. It'll it'll be done uh, differently. It'll be a, a Marissa, if you want to describe how it'll work with uh, with you two. But there's a keynote speaker uh, around equity. Um, and again, the the idea of pushing the start date to allow more time to prepare. Um, that that was the thinking behind that. So. But yes, there's still a convocation, and there's some there's some important work to do with that as well. So I don't know if you need any, I don't know if you need to follow up, Marissa. But that's yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Chapman? No. Thank you. Is there any other questions uh, relating to this conversation? I know there's a, a lot of stuff going on. I I know there's some follow up. Um, I want to be respectful of the time because I know we're we're moving through it. I think we've shot the agenda out the window so but are there any other questions any other comments miss thompson did you have something else i have uh, Can you turn, thank you uh one more question about did i don't know if we got a definite answer of if the tier one students are in class all week if they will be learning with the a students and the b students I'm sorry if maybe I missed it when it was answered, but if those tier one students are in that classroom, say all four days, are they learning the same thing? They're not. Ms. Babish. Jen Babish. So if we think about the um, tier one students, let's say they do hybrid, and so they would be, maybe they're, they're in class on Monday and Wednesday, and then they would be home, right, in a normal situation on Tuesday and Thursday. So they do more of that asynchronous learning. And so if they are in the building and in the classroom, they would still get that lesson, but they would just be in, in the school instead of at home. And so, as I mentioned before, it would still be a different lesson with that gradual release. So they would get that same, same lesson that they would have at home, but they'd be in class. Okay. So new learning every day. So okay. new learning every day. Uh, new learning every day, okay. So then like, whatever the teacher was teaching for the B student, say they were A students, and then they're in class, when the B students are there, the teacher will have something for them to be, they would be doing what all the other kids who are at home would be doing, and it wouldn't really be, it would just be following what the other kids are doing. Yep, okay, so. Sorry no, for that's, asking that that's, again, but. No problem, so like if I'm lesson planning for Monday through Thursday, and I'd have a new lesson, each day, and that's where those groups of teachers will determine what, what am I gonna do synchronously, what am I gonna do asynchronously, um, regardless of where the student is at. So it'll be new learning each day. Okay, all right, and then um, oh, I had something that went with that and it just popped out of my head, I'm sorry. Um, I think that, that answers that question, thank you. Could I ask a question uh, for Mr. Uh, Ro is it Roser? I'm sorry. Um, in regards to the uh, disinfectant spray that we're using, how how have our custodians been trained in using this? And I went online and looked up the Clorox Total 360 disinfectant spray and the guidelines of how it should be used, how we need to dispose of it because it cannot be put into, a, you know, we can't dump it. It's not allowed to go into drains. It's not allowed to go into our water systems. Um, it says we need to provide 
chemical resistant impervious gloves that comply with the approved standard should be worn if the risk assessment indicates skin contact is possible. Um, and that the most suitable glove chosen in consultation should be a European standard EN374. Um, there's talk of appropriate footwear and additional protective clothing. It goes so far as to say that um, we have to provide eye wash stations and safety showers anywhere that this would be used in case they got contaminated. Um, I'm sure they'll be wearing all the proper safety gear that they need to wear, but you know, when handling chemicals, uh, we have to make sure that if for some reason something was to get on them, that they are able to properly decontaminate themselves. Um, it even goes so far as to say contaminated work clothing should not be allowed out of the workplace uh, and that it should be washed before reuse, uh, clean equipment in the workday every day. Um, they should wash their hands, obviously, at the end of, you know, before they eat or do anything else. Um, and, you know, the respiratory protection to make sure they're not breathing this in. And then um, the hazardous waste needs to be taken care of uh, according to our local and national provisions. So do we have all of these, you know, and they can't be stored in anywhere. It has to be in a controlled environment, so it's not going to get I hot. think you're looking at a different chemical than we're actually using. We're using, our main chemical that we use in the sprayers is uh, Delpro 128. We did use, in the past, we used a, a Total 360, it was called. It came from Clorox, but our new chemical is Delpro 128, which also does, when you're aerosol, aerosolize any disinfectant. There are many requirements, safety requirements, that we did do a, a job hazard analysis on. We had a consultant come in and do that. And we purchased the recommended P PPE that they did ask. They, were, they do need to wear eye goggle protection. They knew, need to wear gloves. And they knew, do need to wear a N95 or KN95 respirator. So we've purchased all those for our custodians. We had our vendor come in and do a training with our custodians. Um, we actually had uh, fit testing done for the uh, N95 respirator fit testing, and we provided our custodians with those uh, those masks. So the chemical we're using, are, it's a, the, the SDS sheet shows it in the concentrated form. Actually, when it's not in the concentrated form, it's diluted down one ounce per gallon of water. So it's fairly diluted. It's, it's not a real harsh disinfectant that we use. So when you read the SDS sheets on some of these chemicals that we dilute down, they do look very scary, but we've had assurances that uh, in a diluted form, the chemicals we're using are safe as long as our custodians are wearing the proper PPE, which we're, we will provide. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, in the email I thought it said we would use this one and then go to that other one when we didn't have this. Yes, we started using that one, and then it, it became very difficult to source with our with the supplier, so we, we just switched over to the 128. All right, thank you. Ms. Ellison? I just have one final question. Um, at the last meeting, we talked a lot about how we have been communicating with other districts and learning from other districts and sharing information. And in thinking about the actions that other districts have taken in the last couple of weeks and you know the beauty of being a local control state means that we can make these different decisions what's the the thinking behind starting a week later rather than a soft open with a couple of weeks of distance i mean i know that we voted as a board to have a hybrid model this fall and i understand that but in looking at the decisions that Mounds View and North St. Paul Maplewood have made in other districts, what's the thinking behind the way that we are attending to go so that we're, kids are not with teachers until September 14th rather than starting with teachers online in that first week and continuing as a soft open based on what the conversations you've had with other districts? Well, I think districts have um, have handled it differently. Um, the um, 
you know, districts have uh, have maintained hybrid and have um, are planning to open that way without without changing. Um, looking at our data and our where we're landing at in Ramsey County, this is what this is what MDH. This is what the governor's guidance is. Um, there are yes, there are, there are questions, and we're we're answering them, and we're we're preparing to open. The delay allows um, the entire system to prepare better for the 14th rather than the 8th. Um, distance learning at the elementary is not something um, I, I would not recommend that at this point, unless this uh, you know the numbers indicated. So um, I think that's an incredibly challenging endeavor to teach distance learning at the element or at the elementary level. Um, in secondary, I. Um, you know, I, th I think getting getting students in the building is uh, um, it's the goal. It's a stated goal by the governor. We want students back in buildings, and they've, we have guidance laid out by the Department of Health and and the governor uh, and the Department of Education. And so, following that guidance, um, this is where this is where we're at. Could it be a different? Uh, yeah, districts are making different decisions, but um, this is where we are. So it, ju it just makes me wonder with districts that are close by, because, you know, as you say, districts are making their own decisions based on the data, and uh, districts that are in Ramsey County are making different decisions. It, it just makes me wonder what else am I failing to ask questions about? What else am I not considering to make sure that we get answered that they're that they are asking like i i understand i've read all the governor's recommendations um but the governor's office also required that we provide child care for tier one workers which is wonderful um and admirable for the tier one workers but then that comes with a lot of unanswered questions for us as a district. And we've talked about that quite a bit tonight, that you know, it comes with additional costs and it comes with the fact that we've got you know, not enough space in our buildings. Um, and so that alone reveals to me that there are a lot of questions that come out of the governor's recommendations as well. And Clearly, this is an impossible situation. The questions that we've heard tonight have made it, and the work that you all have been doing has shown that this is an impossible situation. It is just making me wonder if other districts are going this direction. I'm sorry. Don't be, Ms. Ellison. Finish your thought. I'm scared. And I fully support the decision that this board made. I guess that is my job as a school board member. And I will support it. But I am scared. And I guess there's not a question to answer in that. I apologize. Don't be. I am so I am so thankful for all the work that has been done. I don't know how any of us are getting any sleep at night. Um, but this is this is a really important decision, and there are so many questions that I feel like you are doing your best to answer, but maybe there's no answers. Sorry. You good, Jessica? I'm done. No, I'm done. Um, before we move on, I want to also uh, I, uh, I understand uh, Mr. Chirito has been in the audience. I want to make sure to give him the opportunity to speak. He's been sitting here uh, with the rest of us. So is there anything you want to add regarding transportation, transportation you feel comfortable 
moving that forward uh, and I'm getting an okay so it sounds like we're moving okay uh, Miss Thompson did you have a question um, I I was just gonna kind of go off of Miss Ellison um, and I know what the data says um, it also in the governor's guidance said that it was based on every district's decision based on what their buildings and their classrooms um, can handle so even with the data that's just one of the points we're supposed to take into consideration when we when we do this and I feel that we can do a hybrid learning model I feel that it is something that we can accomplish I feel that we already have a excellent start in the right direction um, as an example Anoka Hennepin decided that they would start their elementary students on the 15th and their secondary level students would start on the 28th um, we're starting on the 15th. everybody starting on the 15th yes okay uh, sorry that was miscommunication that I had received from a teacher in the district um, I you know I don't want to you know I agree that we made a decision and, and it is our job to be able to stick by that decision and I can when I feel that we have everything in place that we need to and I think we have a great start and we had teachers uh, who did an interview with the political candidate recently and they felt very supported by everybody they just have questions they don't feel we have yet to answer that they would like answered before they feel comfortable getting into the classroom they feel that they have never had an issue with cleaning supplies or any of those things of that nature um, that they have always been supported and they feel they will still be supported in that I just don't know if one extra week is enough time at least to answer the questions on the secondary level where we have older buildings we have less space to work with in the classrooms um, and I don't know how to do this because I haven't done it and I and I and I don't know if it'll go anywhere and I so I don't know if it's worth doing and and like Miss Ellison said it's scary um, to do this because we already we already made a vote but I, I also feel like that vote was um, rushed not necessarily it, it felt like we had to make a decision and so we made a decision but now I would I don't know if you how you do it if we can call a revote or if that's even something that is allowed um, but I and I don't know if it'll go anywhere so I don't know if it's worth doing but there's a part of me that feels like maybe we need to reconsider extending it farther than just one week at least on the secondary level can we do start our elementary students on the date that dr kazmer has suggested and then we extend our secondary level just until the end of september i don't think we need to go any farther than that we need our kids back in school there are all kinds of reasons that kids need to get back in school and this isn't going away there isn't going to be a miraculous cure that come I don't feel <laughs> that there is going to be a cure or a vaccination that comes even before the end of this year and I don't think that we can wait for that we have to learn how to manage this and I think our kids are very smart wonderful students who in the majority of them are going to come to school and even the ones who might try to buck the system in the beginning are going to get on board because they want to be in school and they're going to follow the rules and they're going to wear their masks and they're going to respect distancing um, because I just have faith in them excuse me Miss Thompson one I, I apologize for interrupting Dr. Gillespie are there any Kleenex in that box back there or is there any Kleenex in the back of the room 
it's Jody's box, so she don't mind. No, it's not. We'll get some. While we're waiting, Ms. Thompson, please finish. I apologize for interrupting. That's all right. I, I guess my question would be then, um, can I call a revote? And if I would it were to call the revote, I would ask that we get our elementary students in school as soon as possible and we extend the secondary level to the end of the month of September. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you very much. I don't necessarily know, uh, I, I would, is Jody still in the room? Jody, so according to Robert's Rules of Order, I don't know that this session is, I know that this is a work study session. I don't know that a vote can be had because for us to have a vote, there has to be a, uh, uh, it has to be a board meeting. Is that, would that be a correct assessment or am I missing something? Can you turn on mic 13, please? Uh, so you could, uh, you could certainly, somebody could make a motion and you could, you could facilitate a, a vote if you wish, even in a work session. Okay. Yeah, so I guess I would uh, move to call a re-vote, allowing our elementary students to start in the hybrid model on, was it the 14th or is it the 15th? 14th is a Monday. Is the Monday uh, on the 14th and then um, allowing our secondary students to start on the 28th of September. Okay, there's been a motion. Uh, is there a second for the motion? Question on the motion well, that's been laid. So can I ask? Go ahead. Ask the question. My, my question would be is, well, you're saying that the high school or secondary would start on the 28th. Are you saying they wouldn't start on the 28th? Are you saying they would begin with distance learning and transition into hybrid? Thank so you. That, yeah. I'm I looking didn't, for clarification. I wasn't very clear on that. Yes. Yeah. So I would ask that our elementary students start in the hybrid learning model on the 14th and that our uh, secondary students start with distance learning and then move into the hybrid model on the 28th. So uh, you've heard the motion. Is there a second for the motion? Second. A second by Ms. Ellison. Any discussion regarding the motion? Mr. Chapman. I'm just wondering from a, a legal standpoint, since this, uh, did we have to make a, uh, an announcement in the posting for tonight's meeting that we would be taking action? I, I guess I'm unclear. Turn on mic 13, please. Could you just leave it on? Thank you. Uh, no, there wouldn't be an issue. There would be, um, at any point in a work study meeting, a school board could decide to, um, to vote on something. <clears throat> it's very, it's very, uh, very open uh, in terms of what you can do in a meeting. We wouldn't be violating open meeting law. No. Okay. You wouldn't be. Okay. Hmm. Is there any other thing under discussion, Doctor Newmaster? Yeah, just a little discussion on this. I mean, I have lots of questions that I feel are floating that are mostly related to safety. Some of them are related to curriculum, but I'm, I'm most concerned with the safety issues. Um, and I feel like last time, two weeks ago, when we discussed this, and, and, kinda, and then had that extra meeting early and voted, there still were a lot of things that were waiting. And I trust all the good intentions and all the good work but it's still not clear, and to go back with 8,000 kids and not have the clear tracing protocol, I don't want to have us end up like the Southern schools. I think the idea of the elementary, I'm relieved that the four days 
are, it's more clear to me and to parents, I'm sure, that every day is unique on the learning board. I'm not sure how secondary teachers would even feel about this. I mean, that's the only thing. I think secondary kids stay at a whole lot better distance. I'm not sure what happens when you've got blocks um, and you're only teaching three subjects and suddenly you're distance. But we could have had that happen anyway if there's a big outbreak. So I guess we should be able to handle it. I don't know that it does them much good to leave them home. I like to see them doing work and they're anxious to do work again and start working on their senior year, or their sophomore year, or whatever. I just don't know who's ready to do anything exactly if we change it. That's my only discussion. Other questions, comments? Sure. Ms. Beloyd. I guess I'm not sure what delaying keeping with going hybrid at elementary, but delaying the secondary schools. I don't, I'm not quite sure what we achieve by, by doing that. Um, I like the idea of delaying our start because the biggest thing that we've been hearing from, um, from teachers is that they don't feel ready. Okay, the, the, from the emails that we get this, that, that they're giving us their opinions on these things is, we're not ready. We're not sure what we're going to do with our rooms. We're not sure what we're going to, what the safety procedures are going to look like. We're not sure what, what, what this is going to look like. So um, I think the extra week with the teachers in, they're in their classrooms. They're able to interact with each other. They're able to collaborate. They're able to see what everything is going to look like as opposed to everyone is not back yet. So all of this has been theoretical until the point everybody gets back into their own room and starts setting up their stuff. So I think it's hard for everybody to grasp the theoretical because right now everything is theoretical. Um, nobody knows what's going on with the virus six months from now. You know, no one's gonna be able to predict it. But we've got hard decisions to make now going forward. So I, I guess I just, I'd rather give the extra week and just get moving forward. Let everybody know that, that this is what we're going to do. Here's the extra time to put in whatever it is that you need to do with your rooms, to deal with the safety issues, to, to have some sort of a comfort level that they don't have now because they're not there. And only if, you know, if and until they get there, they're not going to have that safety level or that's the, uh, that sense of, yes, this can work. So I guess, you know, I, I just don't see, post, if you postpone that, then where do, we, where do we stop? Because if we're gonna go with the science, then we go with the science. There's, there's no other way around it. I don't know what else we base a decision on. If we have these parameters in place, and we follow those parameters, and we're all looking at the data, and we're all reading all of uh, the scientific data coming out, and we're all reading the articles that are coming out, and I don't believe that we are a Southern school. We're not gonna allow kids to show up with no masks on. We're not gonna allow 10,000 kids in a hallway so they can be super spreader events. It's not, it's not what we're gonna do. And I obviously would not support that anyway. But somehow we have to find a stopping and a starting point to all of this. Because we can keep pushing it back, but I don't think we're going to see things change. Not within the next couple of months. So what do we do? We have to find a way to move forward for everybody. So that's just my humble opinion. Thank you. Sure, Dr. Newmaster. I think the biggest issue I know with teachers is safety, but it's not just teachers, it's parents. I'm getting parents who are medical professionals that are saying, I'm not feeling good about this. I don't have enough understanding 
of what is being planned here. But they have a choice. They can do distance. They don't have to send their kid to school. They can homeschool. They can do a number of things. But those of us that are in the schools need to know that the safety protocol is there, whether it's mass compliance or reporting or what do you do with a sick kid or how do you communicate. And I think a lot of people just aren't sure yet as they start going back to school. How is someone who is positive has symptoms, has been exposed, does that get reported? Do they have to test and it's slow to come back? So I think there's real safety issues with parents who have kids in our schools and their choice is distance. And the people that are here need to know what the safety protocols are. So maybe that extra four days helps that. But those are the sorts of things I'm iffy about the number of kids in class, the spacing, the masks, the monitoring and reporting and tracking. Safety, if we're gonna focus on that and say we only go by the numbers, then we have to follow the whole protocol. And I don't think that's been worked out for the parents that I see and who called me today. They're not as worried about the curriculum as I am. Too bad, but. Um, so that's my last two cents, I promise. Anyone else? Dr. Arcan. I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, if we were to make this vote and we were gonna ask the elementary teachers then to report to the buildings to do their work, um, I'm assuming it would be safe to say that our secondary teachers would do say they're doing distance learning, they would do distance learning from their classroom, they would still come in to work. Um, they should be safe because they'd be isolated in a way. Um, because I don't see asking one group of teachers to come in and letting another teacher, group of teachers stay home. So. I, Dr. Kazanczak, do you have a... Uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's a... Uh, yeah, point taken, I, you know, I, th I think that's an an equity question amongst the, the teacher ranks, yeah, so. Mr. Chap, uh, did that answer your question, Dr. Arcan? Thank you. Mr. Chapman? Would it be, uh, Mike guess, A, please. Oh, sorry. No, oh, I'm sorry. Would it be appropriate, I guess, at this point to, um, I believe uh, Tiffany Dietrich is out here and uh, I would like to hear a little bit of what uh, what she's got to say, uh, if it would be appropriate to, to engage her in this discussion at this point. Uh, that's not typically the way that it's done, is that we typically okay. any discussion would need to be appropriated through the board. Okay. Not that I, I don't wanna, you know, I'm not trying to exclude Tiffany from speaking, but typically all discussion needs to be handled within the board and questions need to be directed. Okay. All right. Is there anything else? No, that's it. I, uh, you know, this is a difficult conversation and, and uh, a difficult uh, decision. Um, you know, as a as a parent of a of a junior, right? As a secondary student, I I think about these pieces and having those conversations with my son. Um, I see both sides of it. I really do, and I've been struggling with this conversation uh, inside of my head, which isn't a happy place right now, uh, and I've been trying to figure out the best possible scenario to make sure the teachers are safe in the schools uh, and doing their job uh, and making sure that our students are safe and making sure that we're kind of uh, moving through this conversation respectfully, uh, but that uh, we need to get the kids back in school. I think that there's a lot of people, a lot of parents that are saying that. Um, and in the emails that I've been receiving, uh, that's some of those conversations. Um, I, in, in some ways I agree with, with what Ms. Thompson said, and, and, and in a lot of ways too, I agree with Ms. Beloyd said. 
I mean, there are a lot of unknown things. I've been trying to ask questions tonight regarding what are the unknown factors out there? Are we meeting the needs to make sure that our, our buildings are going to be clean and sanitized? Are the, is the air filtration, air filtration system, is it up to par? Is it up doing what it's supposed to do? Are we making sure that there's distant learning? Are we making sure that if we, as, you know, as people are six feet apart from each other, are we meeting the guidelines that the governor has set out and said, hey, where are we going and, and how this is moving? And I understand that he'd given local control back to the school board, but are we meeting those standards, those guidelines that the MDH and the MDE has set out? Those are the questions that I've been asking and I've been trying to get, you know, getting those uh, getting those answers and when I listen to those answers the the number one thing back to me is yes Transportation can be handled safely. That's why I asked that question. Yes, the 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 air system is is being correctly managed right we're working through those things there are a lot of unknown factors out there and I, I so you know where I don't know where I'm at. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I I really don't. I wish I had some time to think through these things. I wasn't aware of a vote coming, so, um, but I guess we're going to find out in a couple minutes. So, are there any other questions uh, regarding the motion and the second? Seeing or hearing none, I just uh, um, well ask the clerk to please call the roll. Restate what we're voting on please right yes the motion is that elementary students start in the hybrid learning model on september 14th and secondary students start with distance learning and then move into hybrid on september 28th is that correct yes so before before we move on i want to make sure we're clear so a yes vote would be to approve the motion a no vote would be to deny the motion Correct. Could I just add one point of clarification? The only reason why I was suggesting to extend the secondary to a hybrid starting later in the month is just because those teachers seem to have the most concerns with their classroom and I feel like it would give them more time to get in their room and figure out everything they need to figure out so that we can safely bring the kids into the classroom and allow them to feel like they know how it's going to work and how they can handle it. And you don't feel that that would be done? Dr. Kazmichek, are you confident that that can be managed in the next three weeks? Uh, yes. I'm confident we could start the school year successfully on September 14th. Other questions? Okay. Would you like me to read the motion again? Please. Elementary students start in the hybrid learning model on September 14th, and secondary students start with distance learning and then move into hybrid on September 28th. Ellison, aye. Mullen? No. Newmaster? No. Thompson? Aye. Arcand? Aye. Beloyd? No. Chapman. No. By a four to three vote, the motion doesn't pass. We will next move on to our next agenda item, uh, B2, cognizant discipline, or excuse me, conscious discipline. Dr. Uh, Kasmercheck. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so just to note the, the break, we just had a we just had to change the tape so that we could continue recording. But um, while, while we were waiting for that to happen, the discussion was that we would delay the next two agenda items to a future board meeting. And I think the, the board is agreeable that we would, that we would do that given the, the nature of the conversation tonight and the, and the length of the conversation. So we'll work to put those onto a future, um, probably work study meeting or uh, um, Lisa's item might, might, might fit on a regular meeting as well, just as an informational item. So, okay. So, so with that, thank you very much. Okay. I will then, with that, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. I, mo I motion that we adjourn. 
I second that motion. All those in favor of the adjournment? Oh, I gotta do it. Aye. Aye. Oh, we don't oh. have to do that anymore. No, we Remember don't have to do that. All those in favor of the adjournment? Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. We are adjourned. Yeah.